All right, good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, June 13th, 2022 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on Village, the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes is on her way, we believe. Um, Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, the audience will have an opportunity to make a public comment uh, to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to make a comment to please fill out a card and place it in the basket over there to my right. Um, I have allotted 30 minutes uh, for public comment tonight, uh, three minutes uh, per person. All right, we're going to start off as we always do with the flag salute. So please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are six communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications that board members would like to share at this time? Okay. And that brings us to the spotlight tonight, which is on the spring data review and our key performance indicators. Welcome, uh, Mr. Sissel. Thank you very much. Tonight, um, we hope to do a few things. First, we want to provide that district-level first snapshot overview of our spring benchmarking data. Um, and this is exciting because it's the first time we'll be utilizing the new format that we've agreed upon in the panel over the course of the past several meetings. So we will look at that. Then a little bit later, Jessica Stewart and I will continue the conversation around um, the, the potential measurement of KPI number three. It's hard to believe we will already be starting that next work when we've just sort of <laughs> landed on KPIs one and two. And then to that end, at the very very end uh, later tonight we have a board action item for approval of those first two key performance indicators so we'll just do a brief reminder of what those are in advance of the vote so first we look at the way we have historically presented achievement data and so we're starting with map data this is our math data and as we see we place the, the fall and the spring mean median percentiles and then those achievement percentiles on the far right and just as a reminder that achievement percentile is the the place where that median percentile falls when taken against all other uh, schools and districts that take that are in the map norming study and so a brief overview of this and again tonight is intended to be brief on all of these slides really continues to show strong performance we're seeing slightly increased mean and median percentiles in most grade levels um, a, a slight dip but not a, a big gap in other grade levels we do still still see some distance between the mean and the median which tells us that we still likely have more outliers on the on the lower end of the data but again overall strong achievement in mathematics especially when we look at that far right spring 22 achievement percentile column as compared to the norming study of all other schools and districts. Our reading data, similarly, when we look at the achievement percentile at the far right, is still strong achievement across the board. We are in some cases seeing a little bit of distance in, in the other direction between some of our fall and spring average percentiles for some of our upper grades. Um, but then again, we're seeing some marked improvements in some of our younger grades. And so that's a theme that we'll talk about a little bit tonight with reading data. We, if you'll recall, we had numerous conversations at the beginning of the year about foundational skills and really thinking about paying some close attention to our younger learners in reading. And so that is borne out in, in the data from an initial perspective. We now have to take a look at the idea that perhaps we need to reallocate some of that focus in the coming years to some of our upper grades to sort of make sure we're seeing those same gains and those same consistent achievement levels um, as we go through the reading data. The other thing we've always shown historically is the Ames Web Early Literacy. So again, here we look to the far right of the screen for the most meaningful data where we see almost 70% of our students in the green, which is a, a good solid number for our kindergarten students, especially recognizing you know, the year that we have had in the beginning of that year. So we're, we're excited to see that. Early numeracy, we see even more um, in the green. This is an assessment that's only two years old for us, so we're still kind of looking at the longitudinal impact of that. 
in the fall, we spent a lot of time on this slide where we saw a large percentage of our students in the red. This is fall data then from Ames Web for our current first graders. And then again, we showed the next slide, which was the spring data, where we saw those colors starting to shift, more students in the green, less in the red, less in the yellow. And now as we focus on that same area and look at our spring data, we see that green bar has continued to grow. So again, this is a success story. We are in any group of students, we're going to statistically have some students who are in that red column and in that yellow column. But this is an area that we paid great attention to after that fall data came out. And we're really excited to see the results of that, again, at the district level. This is that first grade early numeracy. Again, a similar to kindergarten um, success story there. We're seeing great readiness in those skills. As we move into the newer presentation of, of this data through the ECRA platform, I just wanted to put a couple reminders on here. So as a reminder, the way ECRA measures growth is they begin with that smallest dot. They look at an individual student's performance in the prior year on all of the assessments that are universally administered in District 58. That information, combined with our local norms, so the, the, the sense of how does a typical student in District 58 perform, what is that range, brings us to that student's propensity score, their individual number that predicts their achievement. So that again, that propensity score can be applied to any assessment we're going to take and that each individual student has a projection at any point during the year, fall, winter, or spring. So then in this case, we're looking at the spring actual scores and the way we're recognizing or measuring growth for any individual student is the distance in either direction between their projected score and their actual score for spring. So it's a little bit of a mind shift. This isn't necessarily, this isn't growth from fall to spring or from winter to spring. This is growth based upon the difference between that individual student's projection based on their propensity score and their actual score. And because each individual student has that information, then any group of students' growth measurement is based on the, 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 the summary of all, in, of all individual students within those groups. ECHA reminds us, too, that a negative growth score does not mean a student is losing knowledge or not gaining knowledge. It means that they are not quite meeting that, pro that projection that was made. So it's not that they didn't learn, it's that they didn't quite match their projection. And again, ECRA talks too about that range of expected growth. And again, we've had these conversations at the board table, but just as we put it alongside data for the first time, statistically, until we get to one standard deviation from the mean, ECRA does not consider that to be a statistically significant difference from expected growth. So again, if a student hit their projection exactly, if they performed exactly as projected, as projected that their growth score would be zero. So we have to think about everything as distance from zero. And the, the significance becomes greater the further the distance is from zero for an individual student and for groups of students. And so to make it easy for us to digest, and I have to say that even watching building teams begin to work through this, this, this system is really helpful to focus our attention quickly in the areas that we want to spend more time talking about. Those blue dots are where we're going to see growth that is beyond and higher than expected growth for a group of students or for an individual. Anything within green is expected. Yellow is lower than expected. And then red would be an area we would want to spend a little more time learning about, as that really is now two standard deviations away from the projection. The initial summary, before we put the numbers on the screen, our ECRA consultant you know, works with all of the, well not all of the, but many of the school districts involved in using ECRA for data analysis. And her first statement to us is that overall, spring results show that district level growth is in the expected range for both math and reading, which indicates that we've recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And I want to just pause there for a second, because I think there are times when we are cautious about over-celebrating things. But in the aggregate, at the highest level, when we look at it from a district lens, that says that this year, overall, we have, we have achieved the, the amount of growth that would have been expected pre-pandemic in a year that we know is not post-pandemic. You know, we've talked many times about the instructional interruptions and the, the shifts we've had to make in response to not only student learning, but student understanding of routines and expected behaviors and things like that. So at the very beginning, I think it's important to recognize the, the work that's gone in at home certainly, but at school significantly to realize that. 
as with anything, as in any year, as you start to peel back layers and look at more specific areas, you're going to find places where that, that growth does vary. And so ECRA also did point out for us, which is which we've observed in the data, that district level reading growth generally is trending lower. And there are some buildings that then haven't recovered to that pre-pandemic level in reading specifically. Also in math, we've had a couple of schools where we're seeing greater than expected growth. We have a school where we're seeing lower than expected growth. And so this is the beginning of the next steps as we start to look at what those things are. Worth mentioning that those projections, right from a few slides ago, were based on student performance in last school year, which included our historic high MAP performance in fall of 2020 when all students took the MAP assessment remotely. And so that's just one of those things we keep in mind in terms of what set those projections for us. Um, the other thing, as we continue to kind of reference that we're going to see some, some differences between our reading data and our MAP data, the timing is, is good. Reading was the first curricular area that we adopted. It was a primary area of focus in 2017, 18, even 18, 19. The past few years have seen science and then mathematics adopted an additional focus in that area. Systematically, we're already poised for that additional focus on reading from a system level, and we'll talk more about what that will look like at a building and instructional level. So, Every ECRA report will always show us what we're looking at. So again, we're referencing spring map data in mathematics and reading. The reason we won't have first and second grade this year is because those students didn't have enough predictors last year. If you'll recall, kindergarten and first grade didn't take that fall map last year. And so when we were developing some of those propensity scores, there's some missing pieces from their data that will be included in subsequent years. So we first look at all subjects. And in the upper right is that summary for the district that says we are in the expected growth range when we look at all subjects in the aggregate. And then we can start to look down by school and see that the majority of our schools do have that expected range. And then two of our schools are a few points outside of the green and, and have moved into the yellow area when we look at all subjects in the aggregate. The other thing we'll start to look at as we move into key performance indicators in the future is adding up that percentage of high growth and expected growth. And so that number on this slide equals 79%, which is lower than the KPI we're setting for the following school year. So that, that keeps us mindful of the fact that those performance indicators are appropriately ambitious for us as a district. We move then into mathematics across the board, and here's where we start to see a couple of blue dots show up as a, at the building level. We do have you know, one at O'Neill, we have one dot that is a few, is yellow and a little bit off, but again, in general, we're seeing positive things from this first level lens of a lot of expected level growth in mathematics, which again, is aligns with the work that was done in ensuring that all of the new instruction and the new curricula were adopted and implemented with fidelity over the past couple of years. As we move to reading, we start to see more of a green and yellow picture across the district. And again, so this, this in some ways aligns with what I mentioned earlier in terms of what have our areas of focus been. I think as we get into the grade level slides, we can look at that a little bit too. But this points us to, at a building level, most buildings are going to be beginning that conversation now, looking further into reading growth. Not that we're going to ignore the math data, but this says as we begin to think about where our focus is, this begins to point us in that direction. When we look at math by grade level, we see again most grade levels green. We see a blue dot in third grade, a yellow dot in seventh grade. One of the things we have to remember when we're looking at this and as we move into further analysis is that this is the grade level that the student is in based on their homeroom. This is not, once we hit third grade, necessarily the level of mathematics that the student is taking. So that's another layer of analysis as we get into this. And one of the things I missed mentioning at the beginning is just the recognition that we received this data from ECRA on Thursday last week at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And so while I'd like to say that we have thoroughly analyzed every piece of it, that would not really be possible at this point, which is why we're kind of starting at that higher level and looking for what are our next focal points. Reading by grade level, here's again where we see similar to what we saw in math achievement. We're seeing green dots primarily in second, third, and fourth grade as we get into the upper grades where we start to see some of the yellow creep in. And so again, there's, there's two pieces of data now that say it's not a, a strong area of concern, but an area of potential focus is have we now spent time on developing those foundational skills for our earlier learners? Is it time to think about what emphasis are we placing on comprehension strategies, vocabulary <coughs> strategies for our students in the intermediate grades. 
And then finally, we've committed to showing this data um, with district level suburbs. And so when we look at mathematics data, there's actually, there's a lot of really positive in here. Obviously, we have one subgroup that is, that is an outlier in this data. That's an area that we'll need to start to think about how are we approaching those individual students and what kinds of supports are in place. But one of the things to look at in math is that when we look at the difference between ELL and not ELL students, for example, there isn't a huge gap between those numbers, which says that in mathematics, many of our subgroups are achieving within a comparable range. And that's exactly really what you would want to see. In terms of growth, you know, we want to see subgroups maybe even eclipsing um, the, 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 the non-subgroups in a sense, but we definitely want to make sure that their growth is commensurate because of the ECRA personalized model, all of the pieces of background are already incorporated here for those students. In reading, those gaps are more significant. And so that is something that we're going to need to recognize and address. Again, at the district level, this gives us some indication. With ELL students, certainly one of the things that they are, that they are developing because of their eligibility as English learners is they are, they are working on language acquisition. And so this gap isn't surprising, but it also certainly is something that we do want to see closing over time when we're talking about growth. And so the, the, looking at numbers like this gives us that first glance of, OK, these are some potential areas of additional focus and conversation and then implementation steps as we come back in the fall. So what happens next? Building administrators received this data again on June 9th, and so many of them were able to really walk through it for the very first time themselves with their instructional leadership teams who met um, some on the 9th, some on the 10th, some today, and a few before they had the data. And this is part of that instructional leadership team is part of our school improvement planning process. So I happened to be with one school's team as they were reviewing this data, and it was a school that it was reviewing building level reports where they had some green, they had some yellow, and they had some red. And it was, you know, first you have the conversation about we need to we need to just look at the data for what it is but it was really it was exciting to me to watch the teachers in the room say okay let's look at those red <coughs> dots and what that means let's compare it to winter data to previous data we have to see if it's if this is outlier if this is pattern and then they started some really good conversations noting that only one of the teachers in the room interacted specifically with the grade levels we were referencing you know it wasn't all on that teacher to hypothesize it was a building level conversation what are the things that may be having an impact on this and so that cycles of inquiry process generates that list of okay how do we dig deeper we have this first set of data but that doesn't tell us the whole story because at some point we also have to remember that that data comes from a group of humans between the ages of 7 and 14 taking one test on one day. So that gives us the first place to focus. And now we say, okay, does that data align with what we know or what more do we need to know? What are the other underlying issues that could be at play? Is it instruction? Is it other things like that? How can we dig deeper? So that building level team made a list of 14 or 15 hypotheticals that now we will bring back additional data and look at some of this additional research-based pieces to meet with that team again in August and start to really narrow down, okay, based on all of these questions, which one might actually be at the root of some of this data that shows us a room for growth and then how do we move forward as a building focusing our school improvement efforts in those areas that are identified. The additional piece that happens, obviously, is that individual students continue to be monitored and identified for additional support. The timing of the receipt of this data, in terms of the, the ECRA reports especially, that will be investigated more fully by teachers in August and September as they return. And that is one of the things we're going to be working on as well, is thinking about the timing and the process of receiving and analyzing and discussing this. At our level, ECRA also will provide a similar set of reports, one for IAR data for the students who took the IAR, and a second one that combines the IAR and the MAP for the students who have both data points to look at overall growth based on all assessment data. Because of the timing of the release of IAR data and the processing that has to happen, we don't expect to receive those until um, August or September, depending on their process. And so then our board level review will happen in that typical time when we review fall data. It will actually become a much more comprehensive review of now we have last year's data in completion. We have what teams have done with school improvement planning and what that looks like. And we have our projections for this fall to be able to look toward how that aligns with our targeting for the end of the year for each school. So that's the time we will come back around to all of this information at the board level. It really will be, with the exception of any you know, follow-ups that may be asked for, it would be around those curriculum workshops in the October board meeting, which aligns with the timing of the public release of all of that data as well. 
So before we move on to the next portion, again, an overview of data we've had for a few days. Are there any specific further details or further discussions that we would like to have prior to that October overview of everything in combination? So what, first thing for the presentation, what's the question that you're asking? The question is looking, you know, at, at, at first glance, is there anything, that, is there any specific area that the board would like to hear more about or any additional clarity that could be brought to what was on the screen tonight, kind of specific to the way it's presented? I'll, I'll share one thing that comes up for me. Um, first, this is the first time we're looking at data in this way, and so I appreciate your uh, putting side by side the way we've looked at data in the past and the data that we'll be looking, the way we'll look, be looking at it in the future. Um, I imagine for at least another cycle, that'll be helpful for us to calibrate. Um, so I appreciate you taking some of that additional work on. Um, I think that probably the main question that's coming up for me is the reaction from ECRA of our growth is either approaching or is at pre-pandemic levels which you know, if they're the experts in this space and they're sharing that type of celebration, then I think we should pause and celebrate it because this district, our teaching staff, have done an amazing amount of work over the last two years to be able to get to uh, that type of result. Um, as I look at our uh, first grade early literacy, these are gonna be rising second graders this summer. <clears throat> and if approximately, a little bit less than one out of every five of those students are operating at below expected levels. Um, they have, I think, designated as a quote unquote high risk. Uh, I wonder if, do we have past experience as a district of having rising second graders uh, at that percentage with uh, that, that kind of gap in early literacy? Or is this gonna be an anomaly for us and will, we have to op will our second grade teams have to operate differently knowing that that's the incoming class? Yeah, I, obviously we can pull specific numbers. My initial reaction to that question is, it will not be the same anomaly that we saw this year with our rising first graders. It will be slightly higher than we've seen. You know, typically we want to see 75 to 80 percent of our students in, in the green, so to speak, and this year we're at 70. So there's a, there's a little bit of discrepancy there from what we would see historically, but not nearly at the level of significance that we saw in the fall. I'm gonna ask, it's probably a super simple question, but I know the student count includes students with two predictors, mm -hmm. so there's slightly different numbers between math and reading in those areas for all the different, probably very minimal, de minimis effect on the overall statistics. But what would, what would that mean, two predictors? So it, 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 two predictors means that there are at least two pieces of data that are relevant to building that propensity score. So it would mean that they have enough data on that student from the prior year specifically ah. to be able to make that prediction. So it could be that there was a gap in the, the, the that, that student didn't finish a test in one year. It could be that the Ames Web wasn't, you know, we don't necessarily administer all of those assessments universally. So there's a couple of different things that could be at play there. Got it. So someone might have gotten something in reading but didn't then take the same kind of test predictor in or didn't yeah. complete the one or, or the other. And, and again, because the other. numbers are so small, we really, the vast, they vast majority small. of students complete all of the MAP assessments every year, but there are individual situations where if a student's been out for a couple of weeks or the window closes, you know, things like that, that can be where we'd see those numbers. Okay. And okay. just kind of a forecast for the board jumping in on that. I know we don't have the IR data yet. Um, this year in particular with COVID protocols from um, the Department of Health, there were a number of students who were out, you know, for five, seven, ten days because they were COVID positive, who may not have been able to finish certain assessments. And so, you can see some discrepancies in the data um, moving forward, just because. It, and we'll get into this more when we share the IR data. But if students don't complete all the tests, but they took one, it can negatively impact their scores. And so, we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get all the results. We don't have the results yet. It's something we're anticipating because of the number of absences that we had that students weren't able to complete. Again, the number in this data is smaller, uh, but I, I do think it's going to expand a little bit when we look at the IR data. Okay. While we're on the question that you just asked, um, I, while it may not make sense in the aggregate, the stuff that we're looking at, if you have a, maybe a new student that transferred in or we don't have previous data, 
do they sort of use some kind of standard predictor so that we kind of at least know like oh you know, so that a teacher or a building leader might be able to go well they're on a typical trend for the year or, or do we sort of lose a year um, on that I, I know it may not yeah. wrap up to what we're looking at because it depends on what the student comes in with so an older student who would have IAR data that would be available from the state for example that data can be utilized with that cross some districts use map and we're able to work through that and they may they may have that data already on a you know on a student tied to their state identification number. Right. they um, you know we do have the local norms so we can see what it would look like but my my and I, I can triple check this, but my understanding is really they, they do want to see those two data points for a student before creating that propensity score. So they will, you know, that, that, that student who moves in with no data, a student who moves in from another state, for example, we likely wouldn't see a propensity score. We would be able to see their achievement as it worked in there, but it would, they wouldn't have the full background. It would, it would take a year to get the, the growth measurement. So I, I'm assuming then that we will use kind of our old model for self-predicting in the classroom of what our expectation of performance would be to still identify I mean I know we have a lot of tools to identify in, in the classroom I just, you know sure. um, since that has to get built based on history I just want to make sure we're not no and I will, I will I will verify that because yeah. I always want to acknowledge this is the first though I've we've had a lot of conversations about this is the first time we've answered some of these questions I also think acknowledging that we are and you all of you kind of did we are building our historical data set in this way and so I think as we have another full year of looking at reports with the with, with the color-coded dots and, and the individual student information that's beneath that we'll get better and better at being able to make those interpretations and even saying well this student is began performance at a similar level to this student and so we can kind of get a, a sense of where everybody should be okay perfect thank you other questions or comments fantastic all right so as we move into the next portion um, we want to start to talk about key performance indicator number three and so this is the draft um, KPI that was presented to the district leadership team and the Board of Education we haven't adopted this yet so this is the next set of work around our key performance indicators where we really have to start thinking about how will we build over the course of next year measurement systems so that we can adopt these and understand how we're going to measure them in the subsequent years and so this is the language that is part of our draft document really KPI number three is around measuring the degree to which students are developing resp responsible decision-making behaviors, self-regulating habits, healthy social relationships, with tie, which tie directly to all of our SEL standards. And so Jessica Stewart's going to join me as we've been partnering on all of this work over the past several years to talk through some of this. Thanks, Justin. So truly just a quick recap. Um, while the SEL Curricular Audit Committee did begin its work in the fall of 2018, our journey really started more purposefully 15 years ago when the district committed to Second Step as its core curricular resource to support SEL instruction. Since that time, we've seen an, a digital update to those resources. We've seen them add uh, bullying prevention um, lessons, and we've seen, seen them add um, childhood protection lessons as well. We initially presented on this work. Um, the, uh, at the board meeting on March 9th of 2020 and at that time we had identified the need for an assessment to further inform our teachers really on the impact of their SEL instruction and then on March 7th of this year uh, we came back to continue the conversation and then we're here tonight to talk a little bit more about it so as you recall the SEL standards are really divided into three key goals that provide a roadmap for moving students to independence in each of these areas starting with early elementary and then uh, leading to what the state terms uh, late high school so as an example for this under goal three related to responsible decision-making skills that progression of skills starts with a student in early elementary working to identify just a range of decisions that a student might make in a school setting by late elementary, we're asking students to apply systematic decision making uh, to those decisions at school. And by middle school, uh, where students are analyzing their decision making to improve their academic performance. On that same skill pro progression, by the time we get to early high school, students are expected to evaluate their ability to gather information, to consider options and anticipate consequences of their decisions. And then uh, finally, by late high school, uh, we expect that students will be able to evaluate how those decisions impact their college and career options. 
Our goal, like all ISB curricular instructional areas, is to engage students in meaningful and explicit instruction so that they, students can acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and atti attitudes to demonstrate these three skills goals effectively. So as mentioned, second step provides the foundation of our core. And in addition to addressing the mandated learning standards, these SEL skills and competencies were identified through the strategic planning process and built into our collaborative vision for long-term student success. They can be found within our draft KPIs as well as our portrait of a graduate. What's unique to our instruction in the area of SEL is that we're without a standard way to evaluate student growth and achievement and to make instructional adjustments based upon specific and reliable measures. This has been especially evident upon return to in-person instruction where students have had noticeable lags that we've talked about um, across academic areas and certainly inclusive of those SEL areas. While we administer assessments to further pinpoint areas for that academic support such as math or reading, um, in the area of SEL we just don't have the same type of tools to turn to at this point. Which brings us uh, all the way around to a conversation um, that, that we've we've talked about um, since March of 2020, which is why do we assess SEL competencies? First and foremost, we assess because it, it demonstrates what we value. Those things we want our students to learn, those things we work to ensure they acquire, such as managing their emotions, demonstrating the ability to make responsible and caring decisions, developing main and maintaining supportive relationships in the same way we measure their reading, writing, and math because we know how impactful mastery of these skills are for their lifelong success. We assess to inform our instruction. We know that student SEL development can be taught, that student responses are moldable, and that stronger skills and abilities in these areas are strongly correlated to higher academic achievement. In fact, SEL instruction is the one area where increased achievement actually impacts success across all other content areas, which is really remarkable. Assessment helps us understand what our students need instructionally to continue on that path of learning. And we use that data to identify gaps and to reteach critical content. We assess to support a responsive system of intervention in the area of SEL. Ideally, we look both to national and local norms to identify uh, and, and use as a, as a measuring stick for our students. Uh, but we also look to measure students against themselves because we find value in that too. Lastly, assessment tells us how effective we are at implementing our core and uh, what we may need to change for all in order to improve their experiences here in District 58. When, when people hear social emotional learning assessment, they often mistakenly equate this to screening students for mental health problems or their potential to develop a psychiatric disorder or their level of maladaptive behavior, as opposed to what it really measures, which is their ability to demonstrate and apply positive social competencies. While there is a correlation between a student's underdeveloped SEL skills and their ability to respond to typical school situations in expected manners, the SEL assessment measures the underlying skill, not the behavior itself. We are measuring a student's ability to persevere through challenging situations, where we are measuring their ability to filter out distractions in a school situation, uh, the belief that if they work hard, they can improve their skills. All of these things do contribute to positive and productive behavior, but we are teaching students the skills to know how to respond when faced with, with a challenge, when faced with adversity or an escalated situation, and it helps to influence that behavioral response in the moment. The following video briefly overviews the panorama assessment tool and its alignment to CASEL. Uh, CASEL is the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, and it's um, a national multidisciplinary network that's committed to, to supporting high quality SEL instruction for students across the country. So supposedly if I push this button again, the video will play. <laughs> hey there, I'm Jack from Panorama, and I'm excited to give you a quick tour of how Panorama helps schools and districts support the whole student through social-emotional learning. 
As educators, we know that social emotional learning matters and the research backs it up. Students with strong social emotional skills score higher academically, show improved classroom behavior and stress management. The very skills needed for success in college, careers, and in life. With Panorama, you can start by measuring students' social emotional learning skills and supports with research-backed surveys and assessments. It's easy to customize a survey that meets your district's needs, as you can choose from over 22 topics like growth mindset, social awareness, and self-management, or any of the topics that align to the CASEL framework. The survey will take students about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and teachers and staff can also rate their students' skills right from within Panorama. Once the data is collected, get immediate insight into student voice, what students are thinking, and how they feel about their skills, habits, and mindsets. See how each score compares to Panorama's national benchmarks. Then dig deeper to explore each topic in more detail, like how it's changed over time, or any gaps between student groups, and how students responded to each question individually. Then, identify individual students' strengths and opportunities for growth by filtering student-level SEL results to create smart groups, which will update as new SEL surveys are run over time, allowing you to add specific students to a group for more targeted intervention and progress monitoring. And best of all, our team is always here to help with professional development, training, and support. That's why Panorama is used by thousands of schools and districts across the country. Get in touch with our team to learn how to start using Panorama today. Okay. I love when the technology works. So, all right, uh, so obviously, as with all student data, the consideration of data privacy and security is a top priority for our district. Panorama's security system is commensurate with the industry standards for scope of information that's gathered and is comparable to other systems that we already use in the district uh, for the work of things like special education. Their systems address all the applicable laws, including COPA, FERPA, and SOPA, and which are in line with other products we utilize. When working with Panorama, we own all of our data uh, and, and its use, not Panorama. As we saw in the video, uh, Panorama has, has far more question sets than we actually intend to use. Uh, the fact that there are so many question sets was a benefit uh, to the product from our team's perspective because we appreciated really being able to tailor our data collection uh, without losing the ability to have that comparison data at both the national and the local level. Our SEL committee selected the following areas for, uh, for screening, uh, grit, growth mindset, self-efficacy, self-management, self-awareness, and emotional regulation. This is an example of how a, a panorama sample question aligns to the skills that we are teaching within the learning standards and goals. So if you actually start on the far right side, uh, we're looking at a late elementary example, and we can see that applying constructive approaches in resolving conflict is the skill. We map that back to the standard, which is demonstrating an ability to prevent, manage, and resolve interpersonal conflict in constructive ways, which maps onto one of those three major goals, which then ties to the question that students get asked, which is, how often did you remain calm, even when someone was bothering you or saying bad things? So. And this is an example of a sample student report. This is what would go home for parents to see. Uh, the report provides both a student uh, self-assessment as well as a, a teacher view of how that student is doing in all of the areas that are noted, uh, which align to the question sets that we selected. And the scale is uh, rated from zero to five. So the two data points really, uh, in and of themselves, are powerful in terms of communicating where students are at in their journey, but it also opens the door for reflection as to why why maybe there's a discrepancy in the two skills, um, or why somebody sees a strength that maybe the other reader didn't see. And then in addition, particularly for Panorama, uh, what we liked is that it gives some concrete ways to address those skill deficits uh, within the report going home to the family, 
as well as uh, providing what's called a teacher playbook uh, that would allow teachers then to have some ready to go strategies for addressing the deficits that might be popping for his or her classroom. So another question we've received then is kind of what do we do with this data, what happens next? And truly at the district level it would look a lot like what we just did with the other data we have. We would, we would look at the aggregate level and see what areas of strength we're seeing, if there are areas that need further attention from an instructional lens that we might see. And then the same thing would happen at the building level and even at the, the grade level teams within the buildings to really recognize what does core instruction look like in terms of student outcomes. In the same way that Jessica just mentioned, we would then be looking at some of that individual student data and it gives us a number of opportunities to provide additional resources, to think about groupings of students, or to think about some additional support for students if we're seeing that that core instruction isn't, isn't providing what they need to develop those skills. Again, all of that gets built out over time as we start to look at maybe not just a single data point, but we start to build through this and become more comfortable working with those, those patterns like we do for any other set of student data that we look at. And again, as Jessica mentioned, we would have that report to share with families, which not only provides context, but provides some additional ideas and resources and, and, and ideas for, for families to think about at home as well. At this point, we're, we're kind of reaching that the same moment we did with KPIs 1 and 2 several months ago, where we need to start to get a, a, a good sense of what direction we want to head. And so building on the success of the pattern of conversations we had around KPIs 1 and 2, I'd like to start with, or we'd like to start with sort of the, the first level concept question, which really comes down to, are we, do we have a comfort level with accessing a third party to help us analyze and interpret this kind of data? So just thinking about what that, and just generally speaking, that means that we would have access to that fully research-backed methodology and analysis, the nationally normed data that we've talked about a few times that really helps to give us perspective of where our students are relative to students in the United States, those generated reports that provide research and context and, and, and frankly spit out very nicely and cleanly from the systems, that additional resource that we get not only internally with the Panorama Playbook, but things we can share with families, and candidly, the, the relative ease and efficiency of implementation. There is a capacity function to using a company. I think we're, you know, we're seeing the beginnings of the benefits of ECRA for doing some of this analysis for us. Those benefits exist when you access a company whose expertise is in that data analysis. If we were to say we were not interested in moving forward with a third party, then in order to measure not only this KPI, but also our core instruction, we would need to begin to work on that internally. Um, we would lose some of the benefits on that prior screen unless we were to contract another assessment development type of company and, and work with that. We would be doing the analysis internally. We would be, we would be you know, creating and generating all of those pieces. Is it possible? It certainly is, is possible for us to do that as a school district. Will it have an impact on our timeline and our ability to make that happen without you know, assuming we're not not devoting additional staff or creating additional staff for, for something like this, that would it, would it would delay our timeline. But it is one possible direction to go. And I think at this point, that is the, the first level of direction that we're kind of hoping for from the board going forward. I think also building off of the, the, the eventual success of our conversations around the last couple of KPIs, we want to make sure there's plenty of time to digest and process all of this information even before we dive into a discussion. And so recognizing both the length of tonight's agenda and the complexity of this conversation, we'd like to have a discussion in July that really asks that question about are we, do we have an indication of yes, the board has enough comfort to move forward with a third party vendor in general around an SEL assessment, or no, we would need to begin looking in a different direction. Realistically, you've heard from us many times, that third party vendor is Panorama. That is, the, that is the vendor we would believe that can do the best of what we want, as Jessica really went through and described. But I think really the first question is, will we, will we have that comfort in general of going outside? That's sort of layer one to working at this. So that's the conversation we would want to have in July. I would also encourage, again, building off that past success, if this is an area where any of you as individual board members are interested in diving deeper and really kind of even 
looking around at the additional samples we have from Panorama or just having a, a, a more in-depth conversation, just as we did with the first, with the ECRA reports, Jessica and or I would be happy to schedule that time with you between now and the July board meeting. I frankly, for me, in preparing to come back around with the ECRA conversation, I, I found that valuable and I think it helped us to get to a place of recognizing where we are collectively and being able to have a really good, well-informed conversation. So. I'm actually not even going to pause for specific questions on this one right now because I really would like to defer all of that after we've had a chance to process and think through it and give everyone a chance to, to work through it to the July meeting. So the discussion on this is, is, is July? Correct. Tonight is building background. <laughs> I'll wait. Finally. Um, the last piece of this is just to look back at our KPIs that will come that are on the agenda later this evening for final approval. And so this is all repeated information from prior presentations, which is so it's connected to this moment. The definitions of those terms that are within the KPIs are listed here for reference. First KPI focuses on academic proficiency. You'll notice the word draft has now been removed. And so the, the, the language has been consistent. We are using the state assessment to as our proficiency benchmark. We, at last meeting, discussed using the state 75th percentile for reading, the state 85th percentile for math. And again, that number is derived when you rank the school districts in the state of Illinois based on their actual performance at each year's IAR. We want to see District 58 in the 75th percentile or above for reading, and the 85th or above for math, which is based on our historic performance. Though the, the individual targets for schools and, 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 and grade levels and things like that are developed based upon the projections, but this is our number in the aggregate to look at big picture academic proficiency. Academic growth is again based on the same reports we looked at for the first time tonight. What we want to see is 85% of students in the higher than expected and or the expected growth category. And so again, that 85% is statistically just beyond what we would expect to see um, each year. Again, similarly, building level projections, grade level projections, subgroup projections are all um, based upon those predictions, but big picture, that's the number we want to see. If we approve these tonight, then these become applied to all data review beginning in next school year. And again, just thinking about how we want to think about measurements. Winter data is typically more of a checkpoint. Spring data is more of the how did we do over the course of a year's worth of instruction. Because again, remember, the ECRA model asks us to measure the difference between if all things were equal, here's the projection, and the work we're doing in a given year to try to improve performance based on the school improvement planning process, based on all of those efforts. So then again, annual goals align to all of this within buildings SIP planning. Specific to KPIs one or two, are there any additional questions or points of clarification prior to the action item later on the agenda? How would you view KPI two growth related to the earlier discussion around, you know, at the district level we have a lot of yellow creeping in, right? And then if we kind of go to the second level, at the building level, we have some some red um, creeping in. You know, to your um, earlier point about discussions at the building level, how do you kind of view um, the the reds and the yellows combined with kind of the percentage? All right, so at the risk of making everyone dizzy, let me see if I can get back to the report, just so I can show it, because I think it, it's, it's it? sure, it's like the any one of the reports, actually, from the, that's a much cleaner way to do it. <laughs> yep, that's perfect. So the numbers are a little challenging to read, but if you look at the, the columns, we have percentage high growth, percentage expected growth, percentage low growth. And so at any breakdown, um, we, can, we can take a look at how, what percentage of students for those groups are in the high growth and the expected growth combined and how close is that number to 85 percent right because okay. that's our target and so literally so this report exists again at the building levels as well you can generate it for pretty much any subgroup you're looking for and so that's how we can apply that measurement again for from our purview we would be looking at reports like this to say how did buildings do how did grade levels do but then at each building uh, a building team can take a look and say at the at you know at, at in fourth grade at pierce downer how what how, what percentage of students are in those two columns so we have that ability at every breakdown. All right. I guess, James, what is that number since you have that in front of you? For the, 16 the, the, total, the total number? Yes. 
So uh, 79, right? 16 and 63, so 79. That one I memorized because I had that one on the first okay. slide. So right. I can't remember. <laughs> All right, but, but that is it. But so, so right, so our, our, at first blush, the first time we have this information, we're at 79% where our benchmark is 85%. So though we haven't officially adopted it this year, like that would be a first way to take a look at that and start to, and we can use this to start to build historical data as well. Okay. All right. Th thanks for connecting that for me. No, absolutely. And I, and I imagine since it's a KPI, we're going to track year over year mm -hmm. a graph to show what, yes. we're, what we're doing and where we're falling below. Uh, yeah, and that, I mean, that'll be another conversation of how <coughs> do we want to present that and look at it because Correct. it would be a lot of graphs if we took every single one of no. those boxes. But I think looking at that data is available to us, certainly, and will be year over year. And just to piggyback off of that, Melissa, I think one of the things we're going to continue to lean on is the district leadership team because it has two board representatives and then our staff and, and families as well about how we're presenting this data and the graphs that we're using and are they meaningful and purposeful and, and are we accomplishing what we want to uh, with that information. And I do appreciate the fact that we're not already hitting all of our numbers so we can, you know, like, that we've got some aspirations here to, uh, for, for improvements. So. Sometimes it's easy just to go, oh, we're already at 75%, just pick that, right? So, any other questions or comments? No, I think it's, so I, I think it's super important to note that it's the KPI at the district level isn't an indication that if we meet that KPI, we're not looking everywhere else, just as we vote right. for this. Because yeah, I think that's been made gonna, clear, but- We could have run in multiple areas and still meet our KPI at the district level, but still be very concerned about what's going on in those those red areas. Right, right. and I think, that's, right. I think that is the beauty of this format, is it mm -hmm. gives us every level lens. It gives us the highest level lens to say, in the aggregate, how are we looking? And then, like I said at the beginning, each time you, you peel down, we have the same presentation of information to be able to identify areas of celebration and areas that need focus. And I think our, I, really, I mean, again, I was only in one room, but our instructional leadership conversations are, are improving in their depth and their robustness as part of all of the work we've done around school improvement planning. Not to say we don't look at data and do a good job of it, but from that system level, I'm, I'm really excited to see where this will all take us. And, and, I'm, and it's the excitement of our administrative team and the teachers who are first starting to see this, and really, it, it is helpful, and it's, it's a good partnership with ECRA to move us in that direction. Well, Justin, I, I, I really believe that if, if we get to a point that we see solid, consistent success at the macro level, it allows us the opportunity to be looking at the micro level um, more, more often, right? It, it gives us a, a little bit better chance to focus on that when, as a whole, we're, you know, we, we know that we got a strong program and then allows us to identify other individual needs. Um, when we're seeing an issue at the macro level, th that's when we were doing so many of the things that we were doing, doing major overhauls of our, our curriculum and, and components like that. This now allows us to kind of go in. Hopefully that will allow us to see more improvements in those bursts of red that we, or, or even yellow that we see in, in other areas of the district. So I'm looking forward to it. I think one of the other things, you know, to just reassure the board of how this gets looked at at the student level, is there are other reports as well that contain student names. And so if you remember that one, I, I call it the river, other people tell, you know, may call it different things, but that river line is, is where we expect kids to go, and you can kind of see all the dots in there. But then above there and below there, you will also see dots. Well, teachers in our principals have the ability to click on each one of those dots, and it gives you a, a student name, and you can see exactly where they're performing at. And, I think that's so powerful. I think one of the challenges that any teacher has is they're so busy with everything. How do we really condense this and make it easy for them to access so that they can then start taking action on the data? And so that, I think, is going to be very, very powerful um, as we continue to use this tool. And for the teachers listening, you will learn how to do that over the course of next <laughs> See, Justin always slows me down. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Right. Any other comments or questions? I do have a question. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go back to the, the first section of the presentation. I'm sorry for, uh, for going back there. Um, I just had a question about slide 22. And, and, and looking, at this in, looking at this data in this way in the for the first time being presented to it just made me think. Uh, and I just wanted your, your opinion on this. Um, you know, as we um, live up to our belief in equity, and this, this slide shows where we have some um, disparate outcomes based on, on subgroup. Uh, Greg, is this the right slide? Because I know the slide can't tend to actually change over 
Um, okay. Yeah, this is the right one. All right, all right. Just double check. So I'm, I'm, I, I wonder, um, because we're looking at growth and not achievement, are we, do, are we really um, create, like, painting the full picture? Because, I mean, just if you look at, um, you know, for ethnicity groups, the, the, the one group that isn't meeting um, expected growth is our black subgroup. Um, but if you compare them to um, the white subgroup, the effect size is only 0.1 of a difference. So you might look at that and say, oh, no, that's not so bad, right? 0.1, that's, that's a really small number. But if you actually looked at the, the achievement data, and it, that's going to tell a much different story. So our, I guess I'm wondering out loud, are we remiss in not including some kind of achievement component so we can understand, so we can be completely um, transparent with our community about where our opportunities are? So a couple of responses. First, the achievement piece is in this report. I didn't necessarily focus on it tonight, but if you look at the column that says percent met benchmark, right? Even though this is a map assessment report, that is the percentage of students based on their RIT score in any group that would be projected by the correlative studies between MAP and IAR to reach a four or a five on the IAR, mm -hmm. which is the state proficiency benchmark. And so it actually is in there side by side, so you can see those distances at the same time, even on this report. I think the, the answer to your question is absolutely, we, we, wanna be, we always wanna be looking at achievement and growth side by side. And I think that when we get the, um, particularly the state reporting that will come back you know, this fall, we expect the state to go back to doing the full ESSA reporting on subgroups and all of those different things. Some nuances, ECRA does a subgroup at five students or more, right. the state is 20 or more, et cetera. But, so I think that's another place where we'll start to see those conversations. And I think honestly, the other place that we will start to expand those conversations in a, in a newer way is when we start to look at the, the results of the equity audit, the results of ISBE's equity continuum designation and all of those things that we are expecting to have full public conversations about more in October, November, as we start to have the all of that data side by side. So I think the, the short answer or the shorter answer absolutely we want to be looking at achievement and growth we want to you know we want to make sure that that's happening and that the gaps are are closing in both directions and I think the more information we can get again this is the first time we've had this data presented in this way and, and there's other pieces of data coming to us in the not so distant future that will help us to to really continue to make sure we are having this the, that conversation around subgroup performance in a, in a thorough way so to clarify something you said um, would you agree that map data going forward is going to be more effective in helping us understand our subgroup performance because of IR, IAR not reporting subgroups if they don't meet 20 kids in the school? I think when we're looking at subgroups like this at the district level, we'll have both, right? Because you know, we're not going to, none of those numbers are close to five, so we'll always be able to see both. I think, you know, the conversation continues when you get into building level groups where you're, you're going to see subgroups that are less than 20, so we may not see it captured from a subgroup perspective, but if we're doing our job well, we should see it captured from an individual student perspective anyway. So, the, you know, if, if we're looking at students who fall into a subgroup and their, their growth and performance is below our expectations, they're showing up as tier two and tier three students, we should already have a response plan in to support those students individually beyond looking at, at anything else. And so, you know, I, I, always, I, I think we have always said map data gives us more information because of the frequency of it, because of the immediacy of the response and to be able to see it. Um, you know, I, so I think more valuable probably, but I also want to be cautious that, you know, we, we don't devalue any assessment data that we have as we're looking at those right. things. And, and a lot of things you're saying give me, give me reassurance because, you know, the, the, the conversations we're having are very important, but, you know, in all honesty, where the rubber meets the road is when teachers are looking at this and thinking about individual, individual students and like, the fact these conversations are happening is um, is really like the, the most important piece of it. No, I agree. And that's why, you know, when I say we can't give a thorough analysis because we just got the data Thursday, it's not because I haven't looked at every possible report. It's because me looking at those reports, I can give you a very first level, well, here's what might be possible, but at best, I'm asking questions based on things I know. The people we need in those conversations are the teachers who know those students and can really speak to what you know what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis and how is that informing all of this performance. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. I have a I have a question uh, piggybacking off of Greg's questions. Uh, there's the altitude that we're looking at the data here, and then there's the altitude all the way down to the individual student level. Uh, 
this might be me speculating, so I'm going to just ask the question and not try to speculate on it. Is there a, when we think about response to the data, when we see trend lines by grade level or by, or by subgroups or by school, is there a response that's not at the individual student level, not at the board table level, but somewhere in between? And help me understand, well, what are those levers that we currently have as a district to do what would be more system level intervention as opposed to individual and student intervention or adopting an entire curriculum as a district intervention, right? Sure. Um, I think, you know, historically, if we go back six, five and a half years, we were looking at math data where we saw some consistent values in certain grade levels. And then we said, okay, before we overhaul everything, what, where are those specific gaps in that grade level? And so we dug into what are the skills that in general aren't being met and do we need to add some supplementary pieces at a system level rather than a complete overhaul? Is there a way to systematize it? That example led to a complete overhaul, but not before we tried the what can we add in, in a couple of years and does it, does it pay off? Does it give us that? You know, I think, um, again, it's going to kick back to that school improvement planning process to some degree too. I think that the response to, again, going back to our first grade uh, early mm -hmm. literacy example, that response varied by school based upon how those percentages fell, where the students were, and what the specific skills were. You know, each, and may, you know, we, we didn't develop a district specific response. Building teams developed systems and responses that led to that growth as we went through. So that's an example of similar but not same. Now, after that year, we can look back and say, okay, where did we see the most success with the kinds of systems that were put in place? And can we scale that potentially to second grade or to next year's first grade? Or where, you know, how do we make that work? So I think that there's, that there's a couple examples of like district level but not that full intensity. And then at the building level, you know, it's going to be building wide through school improvement, but then really grade level teams of teachers, that those two and three teachers working with an interventionist or a reading specialist, one of the first things we ask teachers to do when they review at data meetings is say, what does this mean about tier one instruction? What does this mean for all students and our commitments we need to make to change or shift some of the focus in our tier one instruction based on the data we're seeing. So that's another example of where you might see, a, a not quite down to the micro micro level, but a grouping of students that would receive a response to that kind of data. Follow up to that, first of all, thanks for that, because I think that help, it's helpful to see things that we can do at a greater level or at a subgroup level that uh, doesn't necessarily impact the entire system, but is targeted. Uh, one of the things that I love about the uh, ACRA's footprint is, if I understand it correctly, they have multiple, numerous numbers of districts data alongside ours. Now, obviously, there's uh, you know data privacy things that are in place to secure it. One of the things that I'm wondering if this is down the right track or if you would think about this differently. Um, if we're looking, let's just take second grade as an example. I, I'm not even looking at that one particularly, but let's just take second grade as an example. Uh, or let's take fifth grade as an example for reading uh, on slide 20. Uh, if we're seeing fifth grade is in the yellow, is there an opportunity for us in working with ECRA to provide external exemplars of districts where this isn't the case for them, but it was the case at one point, right? Is there an opportunity for us to learn from external districts other than ours and say, whether it be for a, a grade level or a subgroup, what did districts do to be able to turn the tide for a particular target group of students? Or am I thinking about it wrong? You think we we think about it differently? I don't think it's, it may not be as precise as what you might be looking for, but I can give you a couple examples. ECRA hosts workshops for their client partners that are free of charge several times each year. And James and I actually just went to one in a couple, I don't know, to blur a few weeks ago. And really the purpose of that is to continue to talk about how to interpret in general, how to look at things, but then our consultants are there and other school districts are there, and so they really do invite a dialogue about what, how are different districts responding to the data, and it also gives us a barometer of what does growth in general look like. One of the first ECRA workshops we went to was really a conversation about after they've digested a year of, of pandemic data, what trends are they seeing? And then you can start to say, okay, where do we fall in relationship to those trends? We'll have that information in, in subsequent years going forward. Mm -hmm. Another example of a place that happens is through the networks in DuPage County. The DuPage County Regional Office of Education does a lot of things really well, and one of them is networking um, like people together across DuPage County districts. So the DuPage County curriculum 
department, or that, that's not the right acronym, but that group of which I am a member and some of our curriculum coordinators attend also has a lot of conversations about this and just allows for quarterly time to say, what are you seeing, how are you responding? The, the email chain this spring has been, is anyone else seeing much lower than expected map growth? I mean, truly, that has been the dialogue. And so when our numbers started to come in, in really pretty good shape, I got excited because that we seem to be anecdotally a different experience than neighboring districts are having. So in September, there will be time in those conversations with that group to say, what, how are we seeing what's happening? So I don't think that ECRA can give us a success exemplar, but they certainly give us opportunities to network and learn in those ways. Thanks. Greg asked a good question, and so to, to just tie in one last thing, the on the macro level and, and even at the building level, and the growth is so important because the one thing that we can expect, I think, at the board level here is that in all of our classrooms, kids are growing one year um, when they spend time with us. But when I look at the percent of, that met the benchmark and stuff, there's a big difference to if somebody just missed, missed the benchmark or somebody's two years off. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm assuming through the, the I know we can get root scores, but uh, the, the tool itself, does it allow them to see maybe how far off a, a student might be? We have a kid transfer in at fourth grade, but yeah, he didn't meet his benchmark, but he's actually really testing it at the, at the second grade level, which obviously needs more attention. So yes, I mean, as soon as you click down to the student level, you know everything about that student for this year. Their propensity score, their actual score, the distance comparison to national, comparison to local, that's all there. I mean, the other piece of information is teachers still, this will not be the only place teachers go for information. Being able to look at just those map reports that we've become familiar with over the past decade is another next day look at, okay, based on yesterday's test, Here's the percentiles that students are scoring at, and that gives me, you know, that does give, it doesn't give me the IAR percentage necessarily, but it gives me a sense of where is that achievement falling based on yesterday's assessment. So okay. all of that is still available for sure. Appreciate it. Yep. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we're not going to move on to reports to the board. We're going to start off with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Okay. Well. Um, it's June 13th, so on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to thank the student staff, families, uh, for their partnership this past school year. We were able to have a very successful school year, thanks to everyone working together on behalf of our students. I'm extremely proud of how our district has navigated very challenging waters this year, and they were very challenging. Uh, there were many long nights uh, in this room as, as we navigated things. Um, I do believe we weathered the storm much better than other districts. Um, again, not comparing our, us to anyone else, but there's always a sense of community and always doing what's best for kids and, and I think we've done a really good job on that. So I want to thank the board and I want to thank our entire community because again, as you turn on the TV, not everyone has been able to navigate it the way we have here in District 58 and so I'm very proud of the work that we've done. Uh, we certainly hope that our staff and students uh, take a break and they enjoy themselves this summer. Um, the school offices are officially closed tomorrow uh, till, and then they open up in late July, but the district office is still open. So if anyone has any questions or concerns, we're here all summer and you are certainly welcome to uh, contact us as well. Uh, we're gonna skip curriculum and instruction tonight given uh, the, the presentation that we just had. We'll also skip uh, finance uh, because we have a big uh, presentation um, later on. In terms of personnel, you'll once again see the most current enrollment updates attached to the uh, board agenda in the superintendent's report. Um, the administration has been very busy hiring staff to fill vacant positions for the upcoming school year. You will see we have a lengthy personnel report on the consent agenda as we rehire those staff who were rift and hire new staff to fill many openings. We're pleased with uh, achieving lower class sizes across the district with the majority of classes below the targets. I want to thank uh, Jane Uzentis and all of our principals for really working hard uh, on that. Average class sizes at the middle school range from 20 to 27 students with the majority of classes at 24. We will continue to fill open teaching positions throughout the summer. The board will receive an update on student registration and class size in late August, uh, early September as we finalize um, everything. So if there are questions about that, if you get a chance to review that report again, please don't hesitate to reach out to Jane or myself. Uh, summer is also a time where we're busy with technology. So the technology department has begun its various summer work projects. This includes preparing old iPads for sale, deploying new iPads, ending the school year in power school, and preparing for the next school year and completing a variety of infrastructure and hardware projects, including the removal of old printers, routine project maintenance, and Chromebook repairs. 
For student services, today was our first student attendance day for both uh, extended school year or ESY at Indian Trail and summer session one at El Sierra. It was a great first day and our two summer school principals, Jacqueline Goddard and Lauren Hartilius, are looking forward to supporting continued learning opportunities for our students in the weeks to come. So uh, no rest for the weary. We have jumped right into summer school and uh, that is uh, proceeding very well. In terms of facilities, District 58 will tackle the following projects this summer. This summer we'll be completing uh, its most, uh, the district, its most critical facility projects including masonry remediation at Henry Puffer, Fairmount, El Sierra Highland, and Kingsley. Asbestos abatement and flooring replacement at Henry Puffer. Paving improvements at Henry Puffer and Hillcrest. Fire alarm replacement at Henry Puffer and Highland. And exterior door replacements at Fairmount. All those projects have been approved by the board, but we are starting to work on those. Um, District 58 will fund this important work primarily through the proceeds of its recent Longfellow Center sale. That concludes the superintendent's report. Uh, any questions for me? No, thank you very much. No All right, uh, monthly business report and treasurer's report with Todd Drayfall. <clears throat> I'll be brief. Uh, you have a year to day report. Um, we went through this uh, Friday morning with the uh, FAC committee. Uh, this time of year, in the past, we have been very concerned about fund balance and cash on hand. Uh, this year, we're in a much better position. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the, the ensuring that we're not deficit, but you know, budgeting, the fund balance of the fund policy that is in place and the structure we have with the five-year planning uh, that the district and the board has done for the last couple of years. So we're happy to report that we don't have to worry about if we have cash to, to cover things uh, at this at this board meeting, which three years ago um, we were, we were kind of concerned about. So that's in a good position. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, uh, this is end of year, so it's the beginning of the next year. And you have on your agenda annually the reports, the increase, the uh, adjustments for insurance uh, for the next year. Uh, we have a, a change. We do bid these out with our, our brokers and consultants uh, for stop loss for the medical uh, fund. We have a change in our stop loss coverage. Um, the renewal came in much higher uh, with our our current company and we have uh, looked to uh, switch and, and have got a bid from Voya so that's a recommendation uh, additionally um, our property casualty uh, workers comp uh, coverage that is bid out through assured partners uh, there is a switch in the uh, workers comp compensation insurance for the next year that bid even though our mod factor and that's the factor that they look at for workers comp is to claims versus uh, premiums uh, went down this year compared to last year uh, and it was in good shape uh, but the renewal came in um, what our brokers were thought was was much too high uh, through competitive bidding uh, we came in and have a, a lower workers comp uh, premium for this next year at the end of the day uh, we will be paying less uh, for all of that insurance uh, next year than we are currently this year because of that shift in workers' comp. Um, cyber insurance, one of the things that is continually, even though it's a small piece, um, had gone, had, has gone up another $10,000. Uh, I think I said about three years ago we are paying 8500 now we're paying thirty two. I was actually with some folks from insurance uh, business over the weekend and they told me to be quiet because I was one of the lucky ones that had such a small increase. Um, it is an area that has considerably increased over the last several years throughout uh, industry. Um, you also have in there food service renewal um, for food service business and then a copy of your lease uh, items for uh, some of those changes and then our next iteration in, in removal of, of printers um, and replacement with some multifunction machines. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, that brings us to the policy committee. Uh, uh, Greg? Yep. Um, we, had, um, we had two meetings. Um, one was on the 25th and the other one was last Monday, which would have been the 6th. 
Um, so uh, I, I like adult press update. I like when all we have to do is just look at legal updates and, and uh, five-year reviews, and there's nothing nothing really that um, uh, controversial in it. I, a lot of the the uh, policies that we talked about on the 25th were just just that, just five-year updates, updating the legal references and things like that. Um, one thing did come up during that conversation was um, a uh, policy um, 7190, which had which has to do with. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a paragraph in there that has to do with, with our cell phone policy. So there was um, many factors that led to us digging in as a committee and talking about um, how, we, how we view cell phone usage in our buildings um, and what, um, what we can do from a policy level to affect that. Um, so we do as a district and as a committee, we do believe that our students need to have access to their electronic devices in the event of emergency. We've never wanted to deprive them of that. Um, God forbid anything should happen to them. Um, but we feel like the pandemic has um, has ha provided some openings, um, and that needs to be scaled back a little bit now that the pandemic that the pandemic is over. So, um, in that policy, um, we are creating language that that recognizes that that too much access to cell phones and whatnot during the day has an impact on academics and it has an impact on behavior. So we're trying to gain some control over that, um, and and the committee has um, taken into consideration um, feedback from teachers and from administrators and from families, and that is that is uh, presented to the board tonight in the first reading of that policy. And the other thing is of note is um, the deletion of policy 4182. Um, that is related to masking. That was. Um, this has been recommended by attorneys for deletion due to the fact that the executive order for masking no longer exists and is no longer enforceable, uh, being enforced by JCAR. So that's um, that creates some confusion. So the action recommendation, the recommendation for action tonight is to delete that policy. Tracy, is there anything you'd like to add, especially from the meeting that I had to miss on the sixth? No, you summarized it cool. quite well. Good job. Questions or comments? Your first reading. All right. And if there's no questions or comments, is there a motion to approve for first reading the deletion of policy 4182, temporary rules for face coverings during COVID 19 pandemic, and changes to policy 7190, student behavior as presented in the attached drafts? So we, we can swing, we can swing back. back. Yeah. What? We skipped one on the press issue. Right. But we can swing back and do yeah. it. We'll circle back. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can do Second. That. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. One, two. Member Weiner. Hi. Member Joshi. Hi. Member Ellis. Hi. Member Hannes. Hi. Member Harris. Hi. Member Olchik. Hi. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the for, uh, for first reading the deletion of policy 4182 temporary rules for face coverings during COVID-19 pandemic and changes to policy 7190 student behavior as presented in the attached drafts. Is there a motion to approve for first reading the policies in press issue 109 as presented in the attached drafts? <laughs> so moved. <coughs> Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve for first reading the policies in press issue 109 as presented in the attached drafts. All right. Next up is a legislative committee who did not meet. Uh, the financial committee did meet. Um, just a couple of notes here because uh, Todd touched on, on several of them, but uh, we talked about the year to day report and where those are and just sort of the trends in money coming in from. Uh, the county for a uh, property tax last year if you remember it shifted we got them in a little bit different timeline it looks like that's going to be the trend that moves forward so over time our year-to-date report will be a little bit more in sync to what we've seen in the past right now if, if you look at it there's some numbers that percentage-wise look different from last year um, that later on in the agenda we have we're going to be appointing a treasurer and we're going to be getting a, uh, an approving a surety bond uh, those are required. We, we do that uh, on a regular basis here. Uh, so we'll be appointing Todd and getting a surety bond, which went up a little bit just because that's based on our, our revenue. Uh, the stop loss insurance you heard about, the workers' compensation property and casual insurance we took some time to talk about, and the renewal of our copier lease as we continue to phase out those old, the old school printers and we do more of the multifunction machines. 
And one of the things we talked about was steps being taken to, you know, if you have one little line in there that's, that's in color, it goes to color printing, which is a lot more expensive for us per page. So now uh, when they go, when they badge into print, one of the things that they'll be able to do is say, even if it's coming in as color, go ahead and print it black and white. That can help bring costs down. We don't actually have to uh, print in, in, in black and white, so that'll be, uh, that'll be just a, a nice little way um, to save money. Uh, we have, coming up later on in a few months, uh, probably in August, we're going to be looking uh, at having some RFQs come back to us for uh, construction management. So prior to that, we're going to be looking to put um, a small committee together to try to um, look through RFQs, decide, decide who we want to interview and stuff like that. So we'll be building a team for that. So we spent a little bit of time talking about that because we'll probably want to have the FAC involved, um, some administrators, some staff, um, and a board member on, on that committee um, as that comes along. So that was a big part of our conversation as well. With that, that concludes my report. If there's any questions. All right. Perfect. The Health and Wellness Committee met on June 2nd. Uh, Vice DLT President first. DLT. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Member Doshi on uh, the DLT. Yep. Uh, this will be a quick one. Uh, the update uh, Justin gave today on the KPIs is primarily where we focused our time. Uh, and you'll see a recommended recommendation for action on KPIs one and two in our action items later on the agenda. Tracy, anything that I missed? Kevin, anything that you want to make sure we talked about? No, I think we hit that very well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the Health and Wellness Committee, Vice President here. Okay. Um, yep, we met um, on the second. Um, it was it's hard to get a lot of people together at the end of the school year, but we had a good conversation. Um, still talking about our, our wellness program. We ran a survey among the staff to to kind of feel out their, their awareness of the program and, and their um, feelings towards it. And in an effort to be responsive, some of the feedback we got was, um, you know, maybe there's, there's too many donuts at, uh, <laughs> at some of our staff <laughs> meetings and, and, <laughs> and there might be some opportunities to uh, change some of that, maybe, maybe bring in some healthy fruit instead. <laughs> so, uh, so Todd is, uh, is, is spreading the word to um, be responsive to, to that desire. Um, from a, from a, a, a financial piece, um, through running from uh, January 1st to through the end of April, we are running a surplus. Um, that's typical. Um, our hard months are usually after July 1st, with the beginning of the fiscal year, because that's when our stop, our stop loss insurance resets. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, these are these are the the good times, and we'll be talking about you know deficits um, in in July, August, and maybe throughout the uh, the end of the calendar year. We'll, we shall see. Um, this is a year where you know coming from. Uh, the consultants, you know, they explain in the worst case scenario, we're looking at breaking even, pretty close. Um, um, absent the worst case scenario coming to, to fruition, we're looking at a, a surplus. Uh, but do looking to get, uh, we are looking ahead at 2023 and, and looks a little bit more of a challenging year um, with uh, some significant um, deficits at the end of 2023 um, if we don't have a, 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 a sizable. Uh, um, premium increase on January 1st of 2023. So we'll see. Again, all worst case scenario, that's how we're, we're thinking about things right now, but we, we, we hope for uh, better circumstances. Um, anything else from that meeting? Okay, um, any questions? Awesome, fantastic, thank you. All right, that brings us to the discussion item uh, tonight, which is on a potential, potential referendum for our district. Um, Dr. Russell. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. So you'll see uh, on the screen, we have Paul Hanley uh, from Beyond Your Base. We also have Jim Hobart here. Uh, Jim, if you wanna come up to the podium. Uh, we have been working uh, for the last several years uh, on really addressing what our community has called for in the strategic plan. And that's to really take a look at our facilities and then to see whether or not uh, the community would support us making some significant improvements to our facilities. And so tonight's uh, presentation is really about that public information um, program that we've been embarking on and sharing with the board some of the information that we've gathered uh, over the, the uh, mail survey and then the phone survey as well. So tonight is the information sharing. Uh, come August, the board will uh, vote on whether or not it would like to put a question on the ballot and a lot of the information uh, to help with that decision will be presented uh, this evening. 
So with that, just as kind of a, an overview, James, if you can hit the next slide. Yes, Paul, can you hear us okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. We're gonna now present an overview. So I wanna remind the community that this is not Kevin Russell's proposal. This is not the Board of Education's proposal that we're talking about right now. This was um, really sought out in the strategic plan. And then we assembled a task force of citizens in 2019 that looked at this information. That uh, task force continued to look at this information in early 2020. And then we actually had a meeting in March of 2020 uh, about going out and starting a public information program. Well, then COVID-19 hit and the world stopped. And over the last year, we've been working with that same citizen task force and really seeking their guidance in terms of whether or not we should be moving forward with this. Uh, the task force overwhelmingly felt like we should be moving forward with this. And so here is what the task force wanted to gather more information on and the board agreed on that. The proposal is 179 proposal, or 179 million, excuse me, and it, it basically is in a third, a third, a third. So a third is on maintenance, capital repairs, and upgrades. A third is on health, safety, and security. And a third would be on six, eight middle school additions and renovations. With that middle school addition, though, that would free up much needed space in our buildings, especially on the north side of town. Next slide, James. Thank you. So as we started to seek information, now, I, granted, 179 million can seem like a very large number, and it is a very large number. However, when you look at the geographical size of our district, the number of students that we have um, in 13 buildings, it becomes understandable why $179 million uh, might be needed. Also, keep in mind that some of our schools um, you know, were built in the late 60s. Others were built um, right after World War II, and even one of our schools, Whittier, was built after World War I. So we do not have um, what I would call young facilities. In fact, I think our youngest school now is 53 or 54 years old. So option A would include uh, eight years of maintenance, secure vestibules, middle school grade level configuration, air conditioning, and bathroom renovations. And when we talk about air conditioning, please know that's not just about cooling comfort, it's also about overhauling HVAC to really improve air quality and air flow in our school, which COVID-19 has certainly put an emphasis on that. Option B that was tested will take out that air conditioning line. And so that's what's missing compared to option A. And then option C is a very scaled down version where you would just have the maintenance and security uh, measures that we're calling for. So we embarked on a public information program. Uh, we talked to the board about this in November and October and the board said, yes, go ahead and do that. So we did a lot of different things with the community. It's been a very, very busy late winter and spring. So the first thing we did, and if you are a uh, resident here in District 58, uh, likely or a registered voter, you would receive a letter and attachment from us um, explaining what the task force was doing and what we're trying to share with the community in terms of potential things that could be done uh, to our facilities. And so we sent a letter out with an attachment. We then sent a newsletter out to all of our families um, indicating which facilities and all of them would receive work, what that work would look like, and um, some pictures and really trying to show our community where District 58 stands in terms of our tax rate compared to comparable districts and what our community currently is being asked to fund our schools and our facilities. Then we did several community outreach presentations. And again, I wanna thank our team for all of those uh, evenings and, and Saturdays. They were very well attended. We had them at both of our middle schools and it was nice to see uh, members of the community. We had parents, we had staff, but we also had members of the community that don't have children in the school. Some whose children had already uh, went through our district or, or some who have never had uh, children in our school district. So it was very nice to answer questions and um, we have a very well-informed community and our community asks tough questions and we welcome those questions and we have really good uh, conversations. So that would have taken place those meetings right around spring break that time frame. We then put together uh, several informational videos. Uh, I participated in the videos, we had board members participate in the videos, and we also had staff participate in those videos. And all of those are still archived on our website. We'd encourage people to continue to take a look at those. Finally, we've done a lot of work on our web landing page in terms of what we have done, uh, what we could do, historical documents um, from everything from the old White study in 2012, White's our architectural firm, 
all the way to uh, you know recent questions and things like that that we've got. We've had uh, news media outlets write stories. We don't see the local papers in existence like they once were. Certainly though we um, did have some uh, write some stories about that and of course like everything it's been on social media and people have been asking questions, making comments, and we've been uh, discussing those with our community uh, over social media. Then we went in and sent out a, a mail survey and this could have been filled out the old-fashioned way uh, with paper and pencil and you can send it back in but you could have also done this online so we sent one of these to each household for those that had multiple people in the household they could have done the survey together or they could have uh, filled it out online as well and then we did a phone poll and that's what Jim will talk to us about uh, today in terms of if we were to do this what would your support be or where you feel the district's priorities uh, should be very informative. Uh, we went over all this information with the task force earlier uh, last month and now it's time to discuss it with the board. So with that, uh, the next step will be uh, getting Paul back up here on the screen and Paul can start to uh, share the mail survey results. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Russell. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so this first page is the disclaimer and basically what it says is Imagine if 2,477 people came into the meeting room right now and each had 30 seconds to present what they like or don't like about the proposal. That's basically what a mail survey is. Uh, it's not scientific, unlike the hybrid poll results that you're gonna hear about tonight. Uh, and the reason it's not scientific is that this was mailed to every registered voter household and we're at the mercy of who returns it. Whereas with a scientific hybrid poll, you can, you can exactly match the demographics of those who are gonna show up to vote for the upcoming election. And one of the other big differences between a mail survey and a hybrid poll uh, is something called first response bias. So when you mail out a mail survey, snail mail, um, there are certain questions that the order, the order can't be rotated or the answers can't be rotated. And whereas with the hybrid poll, uh, you can rotate answers, um, eliminating what we call first response bias. So there are a variety of reasons why the mail survey is not scientific, whereas the hybrid poll is. And so uh, this next slide provides a summary of the mechanics of the survey that was done. So we mailed out 20,518 households. There were a total of 18 questions. We expected a re response rate of 8 to 17 percent based on 30 years of doing mail surveys. Uh, we ended up getting back 2,477 for a response rate of 12 percent. So we were pretty happy with that. Uh, lately, we've been seeing response rates more like 8, 9 percent. So to get to 12 percent uh, with that many uh, surveys coming back, I thought was pretty impressive. Uh, 91 percent of those who completed the survey uh, via the old fashioned way, via snail mail, um, and then 9% completed it online. Of those who completed the survey via snail mail, 99% uh, were identified as having a likely voter in the home. Um, and as mentioned, uh, the, the mail survey is not scientific, but it does provide a, a general undertone of the electorate. We've done these for a long time, and we uh, are pretty good at reading the tea leaves in terms of the results, which we'll do tonight. And so as far as who responded, um, females were slightly overrepresented. So if you look to the bottom left, we anticipate that for this upcoming November 2022 election, 47 of those participating will be male, 53% female. So when Jim Hobart presents his hybrid poll tonight, he will have exactly matched those demographics, whereas met who responded to the male survey. So he had 50% female. 28% male, and then 20% uh, check the box where more than one person completed the survey. So let's assume that half of those were female, so we're about 60% female uh, versus 8% male. And so uh, we're slightly overrepresented with regard to females responding. Next slide. Uh, the other thing, and this is pretty common, similar to what I just mentioned with regard to females responding, um, younger voters are less likely to participate in mail surveys. So that 18 to 54 year old 
uh, group is underrepresented, whereas the 55 and older group, group is overrepresented. However, they're not that far off. The, the one that's um, the farthest off is that 18 to 34 year old group. But when we get to 35 to 44, it's only 2% off. Same with 45 to 54 and even the next category. So uh, not, not too far off. 94% uh, of those who responded uh, do not uh, are not an employee of the district or do not have someone in their home who's an employee of the district. Next. 75% uh, of those who responded to the survey uh, do not have a child um, in District 58, uh, whereas 15% have a, have a child in the elementary school, 3% in the middle school, and then 4% both the elementary and middle school. Then we asked, what is your neighborhood elementary school? So this is asking everybody that. And there was a fairly uh, similar distribution across all elementary schools. And later we'll look at we'll look at support level based on that particular elementary school. Next slide. Ninety-five percent own their home. Two percent rent. Two percent weren't willing to respond to that question. Next slide. As far as location, um, fifty-two percent were in zip code six zero five one five. Forty-one percent six zero five one six. And when we look at that chart on the right. It's not too far off from what the distribution is of registered voters um, in the district. 60515 being uh, North Downers, 60516 being South Downers. Next slide. So we want level of awareness um, to be at or about 70% or higher. Uh, we're at 68%, so pretty close. Um, the question was, before receiving the enclosed information, how much had you read, seen, or heard? So again, we're at 68%, indicating a lot or some Next slide. We asked them their satisfaction level with the amount of information received and we're at 76%. So above kind of that 70% benchmark that we often see. Next slide. This is one of the most important questions that we ask. Um, it's a, what I call a trust question. And the reason it's important is that we see a strong positive correlation between those uh, giving the district an A or B in a yes vote and those giving the district a C, D, or F being a no vote. And so when we asked, we asked uh, those who responded to the mail survey to grade the district, we had 18% A, 38% B. Uh, what's interesting is this is almost identical um, to what we saw when we did a similar mail survey for District 99 when they were going through the referendum process. Next slide. Then we asked uh, them to uh, grade facilities. And so here, um, as, an, as anticipated, the grades are lower. So uh, only 21% giving the facilities an A or B, and then 48 and F. And the reason you obviously wouldn't want the A and B percentage to be super high is that if, if folks thought that the facilities were in great condition, then it would be a tough sell to try to uh, pass, a, pass any kind of referendum. Uh, we asked them how how confident are you that District 58 is handling tax monies wisely? And we're at 57% uh, very or somewhat confident. Uh, it's rare that we have ever, ever had a high percentage for that question, up between 55 and 65%, which is pretty much where you fall, fall right in the middle of that percentage range. Next slide. So then we asked about parts of the package on a Likert scale. Um, low priority being a one, high priority being a five. So we asked on a scale of one to five with one being low priority, five being high priority, what priority should be placed on funding each of the following items? So these are ordered based on when we add the four and five together. So that last column, for example, the very first item is 76%. Um, and that and these are ordered from uh, highest to lowest. So what do voters care most about, at least those who responded to the mail survey? Uh, first, addressing plumbing, electrical, roofing, and building envelope needs. Second, replacing outdated inefficient air quality heating and ventilation systems. Third, fire alarms, PA intercom, uh, ADA issues with regard to signage, uh, and then adding secure entry vestibules. And we'll go through each one of these. I'll, I would like you to go to the next slide though. So what I typically focus on is the percentage uh, that indicates low priority, for example, renovating outdated bathrooms, low priority, 3%. Then I look at high priority, 24%. And as I go down the list, I'm trying to figure out where does it flip? 
is there ever in is there ever a percentage where low priority is higher and when we get to that it's where we have a new larger gym at Herrick Middle School and then reconfiguring student drop-off area at Herrick Middle School and the reason that happens and we often see this is that now we're identifying one school versus the many schools that would benefit from the other improvements so rather than a broad brush improvement of all schools now we're targeting one particular school and it's pretty common uh, for that high priority percentage to drop here we have uh, put these into categories so first second third tiers again first tier being plumbing electrical air quality fire alarms security vestibules air conditioning adding classrooms and science labs and then that uh, third tier um, right at the bottom we have we uh, have collaboration spaces one of the reasons that oftentimes although um, very valuable in terms of an improvement to the to the schools uh, people just don't understand that space and so it's pretty common for that to be in that lower tier then what we try to do is um, recreate what folks might hear in the coffee shop during a uh, during a campaign so arguments for and against so as far as arguments um, for this particular pro proposal that we tested and the one that tested the best was the following students and staff should not have to worry about being harmed while at school creating more secure entrances where visitors can be properly screened is important it's 48 percent very convincing this uh poll was done prior to the um, catastrophe in texas I, I would likely think i would think that that very convincing percentage would be higher than that now um, second replace decades old hvac electrical and plumbing systems will extend the life of district 58 schools reduce costly repairs and improve energy efficiency we're at 45 percent jim hobart who will present here in just a minute talks usually uses baseball terms so and with regard to these messages if it's a 20 if it's in the 20s it's a single the 30s it's a double 40s a triple 50s a home run so in this case we don't have any home runs but we have we have three triples if you go to the next page um we we never you know there's no really weak uh, argument for that we tested the last one being moving sixth grade students to the middle school would free up much needed instructional space at the elementary schools still a still a strong message and then we tested arguments against uh here we're not seeing any home runs triples or doubles but we do see a few singles so first one being many taxpayers in our area are at a fixed income any increase in taxes will be a hardship for them and then with the cost of living going up this is not a good time to pursue a tax increase and then and then the third district 58 should have been saving for the proposed improvements rather than asking for additional tax dollars so just keep in mind as we when we're testing these arguments against it's not like we're we're throwing a bunch of softballs we're trying to we're trying to ask uh, arguments for and against that are equally as strong then we asked a tax sensitivity question. How concerned are you about the tax impact? Um, and then we present the actual tax impact for a $300,000 home based on a $179 million bond issue. And we're at 38% extremely or very concerned. And then 60% somewhat are not very concerned. When I look, what and look back at all the surveys that we have recently done in Illinois for school districts, this is one of the lower percentages in terms of extremely and very concerned. And then when I look across the 30 years of doing this, this is again, uh, kind of a, a lower percentage, even though at first blush, you might look at that and go, wow, 38% extremely or very concerned. Um, it's actually not, to me, a concerning number. Next slide. So then we ask the ballot question and uh, we get to 60% yes, 34% no, 6% don't know, 1% not answering the question. And more importantly than those those percentages are, are really what we call intensity. So if we look at definitely yes, 39% versus definitely no, 23%. Jim will go into detail why these, these intensity numbers are so important, but that 39% number is a, is a really strong percentage. And before we go on to the next slide, I would just like to mention that other than New Trier High School District, when we did a mail survey for them in 2014, in which the mail survey indicated 65%, the phone poll indicated 65%, and the final result was 65%. Um, every other mail survey we've ever done in Illinois has skewed to the negative relative to the final results at the ballot box. So what do I mean by that? I mean that that 60% yes, if things were to hold true as they have 
uh, over many decades of doing mail surveys in Illinois, um, the percentage could actually be higher than 60%. So uh, will it? I don't know, because again, this is not a scientific phone poll or a uh, you know, scientific hybrid poll, but uh, just based on history, you would think that this 60% figure, um, feel, you could be, feel pretty confident in it, I believe. Um, so now we look at um, do males uh, some more support the uh, proposal versus females? We're at 56% support by males, 69% females more supportive, although Jim sees a little bit different result in his, uh, in his polling. Next slide. If you remember, I mentioned that there's a little check box where more than, than they would indicate that. So those that, that check that box are at 46% support. And one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons that happens, uh, if you were a financial advisor uh, working with a couple versus an individual, they usually err on the side of being more conservative with their monies. And every time that we do a mail survey, we always see these same results where that, where when the couple is working together, um, they usually are less likely to support the, the uh, tax measure. Next slide. Um, again, this is very common. So voters who are younger um, are typically more supportive. So we at 18 to 54 years old, pretty strong uh, support level. So gray being uh, support, supportive and the kind of orange, orangey, uh, uh, ours are against the measure. When we get to 55 to 64 years old, it dips below 50%. And again, every single time we do a mail survey, uh, that always happens. Not sure what the reason is, but maybe it's folks getting ready for retirement, et cetera. But we, uh, or they don't have children in school anymore. Maybe, maybe they're in college now or beyond. And then here we see, I'll have you go back. 65 to 74 and 75 plus were above that 50%. So um, that's encouraging. Next slide. When we asked um, them if they had a child uh, in one of the District 58 schools, if they indicated they had a child in District 58 elementary school, they had 84% support. Uh, middle school, 61% support. Uh, they had both elementary and middle, both a child in elementary and middle. 59% support, and no school-aged child are still about 50% at 55% support. Then if you remember, we asked them, what is your neighborhood elementary school? And we're not asking them, what, what school does your child go to, but rather, what is your neighborhood elementary school for everybody responding? So at the top, you see the yes versus no, um, and they're pretty consistent. So. For Bel Air, 63%, and we're at 66, 68, 52. Next slide. And again, all fairly positive results 68% support, 64, 62, 67. Next slide. Uh, 59%, 52%, Whittier, 57%, and then those who didn't know their elementary school um, were at 38%. Renters, 80% support. Own your home, 60% support. By zip code, as mentioned before, 60515 being North Downers. Um, we're at 59%, and then slightly higher percentage of support in the 60516 uh, zip code. Paul, can I jump in real quick? Uh, just sure. for reference, uh, 60559, I believe, is Westmont, and 60523 is Oak Brook, if people were wondering. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, and as mentioned, if you grade the district uh, an A or B, you're likely a yes vote, and we can see that. In fact, if you give the district an A, 79% uh, support. When you give the district a C, we fall, behind, we fall below the 50% line, and then if you're giving the district a D or F, um, you're at you know, 71% definitely no. Then just the opposite. So if you think the facilities are great, then why would you want a bond issue? So that's what we see here. If you give the facilities an A, um, they're just not supporting it. A B, still not supporting it that great. Um, C, now they definitely support it. And if they give your facilities a D or F, they're, they're totally on board. <coughs> Um, if they're extremely concerned about the tax, they're not supporting it. 
If they are very concerned about it, we're still only at 27% support. Whereas if they're not concerned about the tax impact, um, we're almost at 100% support. I mean, it's a really strong percentage. Then we asked an open-ended question. Um, why would you vote, uh, if you voted yes on that previous ballot question, um, why would you vote yes? In the open-ended, they mentioned it's needed, it's overdue, it will protect property values. Um, they mentioned health, life, safety needs, general statements and support. Uh, education is a high priority in our area. Um, so lots of different reasons for voting yes. And then I think more importantly, why would they vote no? Or why are they undecided? Uh, 277 mentions with regard to taxes, pocketbook concerns, or fixed income. Um, 131 mentions with regard to bad timing, cost of living. Um, scope too large, total cost too expensive, uh, mismanagement, wants for its needs against certain parts of the proposal, uh, sale of Longfellow, we don't have a kid in school. Um, again, a variety of reasons to vote against the measure. Uh, these I'm not going to rehash each. I'm going to have you go to the next slide, and then the next slide, and then the last slide. And I, what I would just oops, previous I just remind you that we again we were at 60% support 34% against with a really high 39% definitely yes and just noting that other than that new Trier example um, typically the mail survey results have skewed more negative than the final results so with that I'd either be ha happy to answer questions or if you'd like Jim to present his and then we answer questions together it's whatever you'd like me to do any questions now do you want to hold all right go ahead jim thank you very much and thanks paul as paul mentioned uh jim hobart uh, partner with public opinion strategies we are a research and polling firm based in alexandria virginia and have worked for paul with paul for more than a decade on uh, ballot referenda for a whole host of school districts park districts etc here in the chicagoland area um, as Paul mentioned, this is a what we call hybrid survey, a survey of 230 likely and registered voters. We were in the field beginning of April, April 3 through 10. And the reason we call it a hybrid survey is because now we've started to do this in the last four years or so, we are reaching voters in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, with their landline telephone. Uh, two, via their cell phone, but reaching them via their cell phone in two different ways. One, just calling them on their cell phone. We've also started to do what we call text to web, where you receive a text message, text message sends you a link to the survey, and then you complete the survey online. So that is why we are terming it a hybrid survey. Paul also mentioned that our survey is scientific. It gives the best estimation of what a likely electorate in November 22 is going to look like. Uh, how are we able to do that? A uh, couple ways. Uh, what I always tell people is if I take the first 230 people who pick up the phone, I will end up with a survey that's about 85% aged 55 plus. The reason for that is older voters are much more likely to take phone surveys than younger voters. And so how do I come up with an age sample that looks more like a likely electorate? Well, one of the first questions that we always ask is, in what year were you born? Um, if you were born in 1944, do you reply in that way? We say, thank you very much for your time, and we hang up if we've hit what we call our age quota. So we set quotas by age to make sure that we're getting a representative sample by age. We also do that by precinct, for example. So we are making sure that the precinct, you know, the district, Distribution by precinct in the survey is matching what we expect it to be in November of 2022. So that's something that we're able to do on a phone or hybrid survey that you're not able to do on a mail survey. And then the second thing, and again, Paul mentioned this, is when we get into the messaging section, is we're able to randomize and, and rotate things. So it's not like everyone is getting one argument first and everyone is getting the other argument last. Uh, they're randomized within that. And then we also rotate the positive and the negative statements about the potential referendum so that half the respondents get the positives first, the other half to get the negatives first. Again, avoiding what Paul termed f first response bias. Another thing that we're able to do on the phone survey is essentially the very first question we ask them after we get through some screener and demographic questions is the ballot. And we always have respondents read the closest approximation to the ballot language as possible. So it's right here. I'm not going to read it aloud because it's quite complicated, but the reason that we do have our interviewers read it aloud is because it matches what voters are actually going to see in the ballot box or more frequently these days when they fill out their vote-by-mail forms. 
Um, some people will say, you know, this is really confusing. Why don't you simplify? And what we found over years and years of doing this is when you simplify something, you end up with an artificially higher yes. Um, one of the reasons that the referenda fail is because, look, something like this is complicated. And when people see things are complicated, their instinct is to vote no. And so that's the way, that's the reason that we always test the closest approximation to the ballot measure as possible. Where do we end up? 54% yes, 32% no. Uh, Paul mentioned the importance of intensity. And what we see here is that we have what is pretty good or strong intensity on the definitely yes side. Definitely yes at 38%, definitely no at 22%. Uh, the reason that is important is that it is very difficult to convince a no or undecided voter to vote yes on a referendum. Um, and that is true regardless of any type of referendum that you're doing, whether it involves a school district, whether it involves a huge statewide event referendum like you see sometimes in Illinois and other states in the country. Essentially, the yes gets what the yes gets. And what the campaigns are about are those voters who aren't yet voting definitely yes. So, so when you look at this, it's easy to see, hey, this is a 22-point lead. That's pretty good, right? Really, when I look at this, what I see is a six or an eight-point lead. I see this as 54-46. I see 38% of voters who are locked in voting for it no matter what. And the battle is going to be convincing that next 12%, 12 plus 1 percent to vote yes. So, so that's the way that I look at this data. Um, when we look at it, see pretty similar to what we saw in the mail survey in terms of younger voters being more supportive. Um, not surprisingly, 35 to 44 is the most supportive. Those are the voters who are most likely to have children that are going to benefit from these improvements to the district. Also encouraging is that you start out above 50% with seniors. The general rule in referenda campaigns like this for school districts is that if you tie with seniors, you win. So if you start out at 53%, Maybe it ends up 50-50, then the voters 18 to 64 will propel you to a victory. That's the general rule. So it's encouraging to start out above 50 with seniors. One thing that was surprising in this survey is the 45 to 54 year old number. 39, 36, a low yes, also a high number of undecideds. And what we saw when we looked at this is who this tended to be was voters with children who are just now aging out of middle school, right? Who are saying, hey, wait, you're asking me to vote yes for this, but my children are not going to benefit. And what we did see is we did see some positive movement on what we call our informed ballot. It's the ballot that we ask after voters hear all the information, they hear voters' arguments on both sides. We did see some positive movement there. What that demonstrates is that in a potential campaign, that group of voters is going to take some convincing, helping them to understand why this referendum would benefit the entire community and not just the students who are about to enter the district. Uh, by gender age groups, Younger women, the most supportive, very, very common. And then the other groups, younger men, older men, older women, and seniors, really, really similar. All in between 50 and 55%, it's younger women who are the most supportive and really propel the, the height of the yes vote. Uh, this gets into what, some of what I was saying, right? When we look at parents and non-parents, we see almost no difference, 55, 54. Um, but then look at the differences between voters who have children less than kindergarten, supports off the charts, 83-14. Why? Because they're like, this is great. This, you know, by the time these changes take place, my kids are going to be right in the middle of elementary school. They're going to be able to benefit from a lot of this. Those K through six voters, voters with children in middle and high school, they're a little more hesitant, right? They're like, yeah, you know, I like the district as we'll see in a couple slides, but it's not my kids who are going to benefit. Look, you still get close to 50, but that's going to be a really key swing group in a potential campaign is helping those voters to understand, again, why this referendum has the potential to be a really benefit to the whole community. Uh, mom's a little bit more supportive than dad's. That's pretty common. By district rate, again, very similar to what we saw in the mail survey. If you give the district an A, 66-22, very likely to vote yes. If you give the district to B, 58-30. If you get the district to C, you're lower at 44-38. Always ask open-ended questions, just like we do on the mail survey. What, what are the one or two main reasons why you vote yes on this proposal? Something needs to be done. It's good for the kids. It'll improve education. Education is important. It'll help property values. When you see those numbers, for example, 18% needs to be done, that's 18% of the 54% are voting yes. So it's not 18% of the entire electorate, it's about oh, 10 or so percent of the entire electorate where that gets really important is here. 
on the negative voters. What are one or two main reasons why you would vote no on this proposal? It's too much money, it's a tax increase, it's not necessary, it represents wasteful spending. So it's not a core of the electorate, 26% who are saying it's too much money, it's 26% of that 32%, so about 8% of the electorate. More likely, this is what we call our tax sensitivity question. More likely or less likely to vote yes in favor of this measure. If you don't know the tax impact, would be $229 per year for a $300,000 home or to make no difference to you. Again, always like to be very transparent with this. Be clear about exactly what the cost would be. And what we see is that the majority of voters, 61% hey, say, hey, this doesn't make a difference to me. I'm, I'm already locked into voting either yes or no. 22% say it would make them more likely. 15% less likely, very low intensity on both of those. 12% much more likely, 10% much less likely. Um, then we ask, okay, what if we cut out air conditioning, which would make it $130 million referendum, but yes or no, 30% yes, 52% no. So not much appetite at all for eliminating air conditioning in order to reduce the cost of the measure. Grading the district. Solid numbers, 53% A or B, just 12% D or F, 20% A, 33% B. Always a crucial group is that 60% who don't know. Tends to be older voters, educating those voters about the job that the district is doing is something that can be done to help them, convince them to vote yes. Uh, who's most likely to say A? It's who you would hope it would be. Uh, women 18 to 54, children in the household are K through six, so people who currently have children in the district, and then moms, top groups B, age 55 to 64, older men, those without children in the household, so still some supportive grades from those who don't have children in the district currently. Say that the schools in District 15 are better than, about the same, or not as good as schools in better part of the state, majority, 54% better, 28% about the same, 8% not as good, 11% don't know. Not a coincidence that 54% better matches that 54% yes number. It's not like it's 100% of them, but we, we tend to see that, right? Some, some commonality throughout data in surveys like this. Um, and that, uh, Paul touched on this some, but this is the one question that we asked where we ho we're hoping for low grades. Um, just 34% give the district an A or B, 30% don't know. I uh, always think that group is especially important. It tends to be a little higher than the don't know number on actually grading the district. Look, there's a chunk of the community that is not aware at all what the facilities of, of these schools look like. And what I always say is that if we could get every single voter to take a tour of the schools, to watch a video that gives you tours of the schools, we'd pass up every single referendum because they would say, hey, this is something that's really needed when they actually see it for themselves. Um, obviously, and unfortunately, that's not something that's realistic, but again, this speaks to the importance of education, letting these 30% of voters who don't know, helping them understand why making these improvements to the district buildings and facilities is important. Taxpayer confidence, 49% confident, 36% not confident. This is one question where I don't pay much atten attention to intensity. Uh, for me, the, intent, the good or strong intensity number is about 30% or higher. I have never, in all these years of doing this, seen a 30% or higher very confident number on, on handling taxpayer money wisely, like any time I've asked this question. It's just not something people are going to be like, yeah, you know what, this district, this park district, this school district, you name it, is just doing an awesome job handling my taxpayer money. So what we hope to see is a confident number between 50 and 60%, and here you're, you're really right at that 50% number. And we also test, just like Paul did, the various funding options. Um, one thing that is very, very consistent is that you see, this is not an instance where you see um, the, the sizzle being what sells. You know, there, there's an old phrase in marketing, you know, don't sell the steak, don't sell, sell the sizzle. Um, when it comes to passing bond referendum, that isn't the case. What gets voters most excited to vote for it, what tends to be the most compelling funding options, the things that would be funded are what I term the vegetables. Addressing plumbing, electrical, roofing, and other building needs. Replacing outdated fire alarms and intercom systems and addressing ADA signage code issues. Replacing outdated and inefficient air quality heating and ventilation systems and installing air conditioning in classrooms. 
adding security to your race. None of that is the stuff that looks really good on the brochure when you get the architect renderings and all that, right? It, it's the boring stuff. But the reason that it tests well, and it tests even better when we get into the messaging and we phrase it a little bit differently, is because again, it's those types of things that everyone in the district can understand why that's important for the schools to have, right? You know, Paul talked about the collaborative spaces. Those are great, but guess what? The only people who are gonna benefit from the collaborative spaces are the current students, so it doesn't fire up your seniors, those without children as much. And you see that here. Uh, what's at the bottom? Expanding remodeling and existing cafeterias and addressing kitchens additions. 63% say that's not important. Why is that not important? There in no way is that going to benefit them directly. Addressing site improvements include playgrounds, fields, and paving. Same thing there. Even improving outdated libraries and collaborative learning spaces, it's basically a split, right? 54% important, 42% not all that important, and pretty low intensity. So, you know, even though adding classrooms and science labs, hey, that's something that can look the best in the brochure, it's not what is most important to voters. Uh, get into the message testing. And for the first time this year, what we've done is we've added two messages that address kind of the elephant in the room question, right? In every one of these presentations that I've done this uh, spring and, and now summer, or close to summer, um, one of my first questions has been like, well, you know, inflation, how is that going to affect it? So we went ahead and tested two you know, potential arguments about that. Say, hey, the cost of gas, groceries, electricity, and many other everyday items are increasing. However, our schools and our children still need to be a top priority. We simply cannot afford to wait until prices come down to pass this type of re referendum. 61% agree with that, 32% disagree. Then we took a different tax, same intro statement. Then we said, however, with borrowing costs near historic lows, this is the right time to fix our aging elementary and middle schools before prices increase even further. 68% agree, 31% disagree. So pretty strong agreement for both of those statements. Then we get into the, the message that we tested. Paul said that, you know, I like to use a baseball analogy. You know, the way the Cubs are playing, I might have to come up with a new analogy <laughs> when I do it in Chicago, right? I would put everyone in a bad mood if I start talking about home runs and triples. But the, the important thing is that, look, these are really strong messages. 47% uh, very convincing, 65% total convincing, 77% total convincing. Those are, are fantastically strong. What are those messages? Last time a referendum passed to fund district-wide improvements to our elementary and middle school buildings was in the 1950s. We cannot afford to wait any longer. 1950s is like the sweet spot for when we're using this it's been too long message. I tested it in a couple other districts where it was like, hasn't happened since the 70s, hasn't happened since the 1980s. When it's 1980s, we say something more like 30 years. People just kind of shrug. Oh, yeah, you know, that hasn't been that long. When they hear the 1950s, they're like, all right, they're right. We really can't afford to wait any longer. So from that standpoint, it's good to have these older buildings from a messaging standpoint. And then the safety and security messages. You know, when we tested secure entryways on the funding options, it was solid. I think it was number four. But when we phrase it like this, the safety of our students and staff is the utmost importance in creating secure entrances where visitors can be properly screened is the best way to keep students and staff safe. It's, it's the best testing message when you look at the total convincing number two. So it shows again the importance of how you frame certain things that'll be funded by the proposal. Uh, replacing aging HVAC, electrical, and plumbing systems would save taxpayers money by reducing expensive repairs and improving energy efficiency. You know, replace the HH replacing aging HVAC electrical and plumbing systems, you know, that tests pretty well. But when you add would save taxpayers money by reducing expensive repairs and improving energy efficiency, again, that becomes something that the entire district can benefit from. Um, we tested the security, security message a different way, also tests well. Uh, 30 years since the referendum was passed, we cannot afford to wait any longer. You know, that, that urgency messages also really test well here in this district. Um, what tests not as well, um, the two messages about moving sixth graders to the middle school, not quite as compelling. Look, they're still over 50% total convincing, especially when we phrase it as alleviating and overcrowding, it's up to 65% total convincing, but that's just not gonna be as important to every voter in the district. Look, if you don't have someone who is either coming up on being a sixth grader, who will eventually be a sixth grader, that's just not gonna be as important to you. Um, and then again, tested the messages on the other side, not surprised, inflation focused message. We're just beginning to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Prices of consumer goods like gas and grocery are increasing rapidly. This is the wrong time to be increasing taxes. 36% very convincing, 62% total convincing. Look, that's a solid message, but I believe, let's see, we have 
one, two, three, four messages in support the test better than the best message in opposition. And because of that, we see some pretty solid movement on what we call our informed ballot. You know, it go just goes from 54 to 57, so you think, hey, that's really not that much. But the reality is, well, there's two realities. One, we usually don't see movement to yes on the informed ballot. And the second thing is, that, you know, the way we present this, both sides get equal time, so to speak. You know, you hear the positive messages, you hear the negative messages. That is not how a likely campaign is actually going to play out. Typically, there's going to be more weight behind those positive messages. So to see it go from 54 to 57, closer to that number we saw in the mail survey, is pretty encouraging. And then we ask what we call our, our break glass in case of emergency question. So go through all that and we say, okay, bond referendum is reduced from 179 to a total of 99 million by focusing just on maintenance projects and adding security entryway at each school. Would you vote yes in favor or no against? Um, it's still 57% yes, but look at that drop in intensity. We go from the mid to high 30s to just 29% definitely yes. So there's not as much intensity behind it. Why is that? You know, look, you have a lot of voters who are, it was 38% definitely yes to begin with. Those voters are fired up to pass the $179 million option. So when you tell them you're going to cut it almost in half, they're like, hey, I thought you could tell me I could get a lot more here. And I, I was willing to support that. So I think that's why you see the dip in intensity. With what we call our bottom line, uh, starts out in solid shape with the majority support. It will certainly take an aggressive campaign to pass, though. This is not, uh, I'll use a basketball term this time. It's not a slam dunk. Um, most positive side, uh, strong intensity of support. 38% of voters definitely voting yes. That's, that's pretty high. We usually don't get into the high 30s on definitely yes on referendum campaigns like this initially. Um, voters also like the job that the district is doing, but they understand that the facilities are not great. Um, looking at messaging, most effective messages center on the amount of time since the last referendum, safety, security, and the benefits of the new HVAC systems, and then the key turnout group will be younger voters, especially children under the age of five. Again, um, when I've done these presentations all, all spring and summer, what I've been asked is, hey, you know, what, what's going to be make or break? Or, or people will just cut right to the chase. They'll hear Paul and I give our whole spiel, and they'll say, okay, but is this going to pass? And uh, what I've said repeatedly is if you get younger voters to turn out, then, then from the ones that I pulled for, both in this district and other districts around the Chicagoland area, then these referendum are likely to pass. But, but if you drop, you know, if 18 to 44, I think here it's, you know, projected to be around 30 or 35% of the electorate. If you drop down to 27 to 28%, it becomes that much more difficult. Now, historically, you know, we're not, that's not a pie in the sky goal to get, you know, 30, 35% of the electorate to be age 18 to 44 here. That's what we've seen historically. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that it can't fall off. Um, I, I don't have any expectation for it to. I, I think there's some other things going on in the political environment that's actually going to spur younger voter turnout. But look, it's always a challenge to turn out younger voters in a, in a midterm electorate. There are more younger voters who vote in a presidential year electorate. That, that is consistent across the country. Um, one thing that's nice about Illinois is with this longer early voting period, you can go and look and say, hey, this person was 18 to 44. They voted in 2018. They haven't returned a mail ballot yet. I can just call them up on the phone and say, hey, you need to return your mail ballot. Um, and, and so that helps with turning out 18 to 44. But that, that's going to make or break both this campaign and a lot of others is, is, um, is do younger voters uh, turn out. Um, and so with that, we will open it up to questions for Paul and I. Paul, you still there? I'm here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the avalanche are playing yet, so Paul's still paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Paul's basically there. Um, yeah, uh, questions that, uh, that, that folks may have for, for Paul or myself or both of us. Thank you very much for a very thorough presentation. I know a couple of us have, have seen this already, so I did want to open up uh, to the board now. If there's any questions or comments or concern? Um, when you selected your group of um, poll, pollers, people you were going to call, did you base it off of voter turnout or, or registered voters? 
So we've seen historically this percentage of this age group actually turns out to the vote. Right. Or did you do it just based off registered voters? So it's funny, uh, Justin was using the term in his presentation, propensity scores. We use that exact same term. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for propensity score for how likely someone is to turn out. And, and so that's what it's based on, is okay. what your vote propensity is. The bulk of that, and I'm not, the, the vast majority, probably 75 to 80% of how a propensity score is determined, is if you vote in the last midterm election. Because the best predictor of if you're going to vote this time is if you vote in the last. There's a couple other things that we can do. We can look at new registrations. We look at a couple other you know, more complex things. But, but so that's what we're basing it on is, hey, do we believe you are likely to vote? I'm not. The mail survey, it goes to every registered voter. Right. I did not call or we did not call um, every registered voter in the district. We, we did call every registered likely voter to try to get as many responses as we could. But uh, you know, if, if you've never voted in a midterm election before, you would not have gotten um, you would not have gotten a survey call or a survey text message. That's the answer I'm looking for. Right. Yeah. So that's good. Thank you. Jim, a question about timing. Uh, this is for a November election, which is still five months away. Is this is this data typically collected this far in advance, or are we too early? Are we sweet spot too late? How would you yeah. assess that? So this is a typically when we, we do the surveys, a um, couple reasons for that. Um, one is that we, we want the board to have as much information as possible before they make the decision. Two, uh, there's a difference in who can pay for it now and, and who can pay for it you know, once you actually go on the ballot. Um, what we have seen historically is that even though we are polling pretty far in advance, um, the, the phone survey results have been very, very accurate typically within about a point or two in, in all the work that I've done with Paul over the years. So um, it's, it, is it, you know, hey, if, if a committee is formed and they raise a lot of money, they want to do a poll in October, I'm happy to do it. Um, but, uh, but, but we almost always uh, poll April, April or May is, uh, is when I'm busy doing a lot of surveys and we, and we have seen that they, um, that, that the, even though it's far out, um, the results are, are really pretty, pretty close to, uh, to what happens on election day. Anything else? Well, we greatly appreciate you being here and thank you for being here remotely. Um, this is very helpful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank really you. appreciate thank it. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you so much. much. Yep. Thank you. All right, this is now an opportunity of members of the audience to share in public comment with the board, but it's not intended for a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board has allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask that you keep your comments to th the three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. I, only, I do only have one card tonight. Uh, Benj Benjamin Ricca uh, in the Whittier area. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, and just congrats to everybody on a successful year. Um, my comment is regarding the uh, accelerated math program, and um, we really think it's a great opportunity that the district offers to challenge students, you know, across achievement levels. Um, but we had a few follow-up questions regarding the accelerated math, the double and single accelerated math uh, criteria and placement. Um, our, class, our child's classroom teacher instructed us to follow up with the assistant uh, superintendent of curriculum. Um, we reached out via phone on Friday, June 3rd, um, left some voicemail, uh, reached out again on Tuesday, June 7th, left voicemail and also spoke with uh, secretary, reached out again on, and we've received no response, so we reached out again on June 9th. Um, you know, we've received no callbacks, no, uh, no callback to schedule a meeting, no, no response to set expectations on when further information might be available. Uh, and to my knowledge, there's been no further information uh, provided via email. Um, so, I mean, we recognize we're one of many families who are you know, in, in contact with teachers and the administration um, over a whole wide range of topics, but the absence of more information or communication has been a little bit frustrating on our end. And we just wanted to, um, if we're not getting response at the assistant superintendent level, we wanted to raise the concern to that there may be a communication gap to the uh, board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So um, thank you for your, your public comment. Um, we will review your comment tomorrow morning at our meeting and we will be in touch. So I, I really appreciate you reaching out. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone need a recess? Do you want to see if there's any other public comment for folks? I mean, we haven't been, but yeah. Is there anybody else that has a public comment? Mm -hmm. All right. Is there All anyone right. that needs a recess? Yeah. Yeah. It's four. All right. <laughs> then uh, next up we have the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revision to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the June 2nd, 2022 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. We'll see. Please call roll. Oh, wait, no, I can do all in favor. Yeah. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the June 2nd, 2022 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 9th, 2022 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carried to approve the minutes of the May 9th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the April 25th, 2022 special meeting slash financial workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carried to approve the minutes of the April 25th, 2022 special meeting financial workshop as presented. All right, next is the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills in summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved um, as presented in the packet of materials. And with this consent agenda is a, a new hire. So Dr. Russell. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to uh, introduce the community to Sandy Cristobal. I'm pleased to recommend Sandy for the Highland School Assistant Principal and District Curriculum Coordinator role. Through three rounds of interviews, she impressed our team with her student-centered approach, her broad experiences, which align extremely well with the role she uh, will hold in District 58, her positivity, enthusiasm, and warm, caring demeanor. Ms. Griswold comes to District 58 from Westmont Community School District 201, where she has served as an assistant principal of Manning and Miller Elementary Schools and as the grade K-12 bilingual director since 2019. Previously, she served several years as an elementary ESL and bilingual teacher in Morton Grove School District 70 and South Berwyn School District 100. Ms. Cristobal earned her Master's of Arts degree in Educational Leadership from North Park University, her ESL bilingual endorsement from Aurora University, and her Bachelor of Arts in Secondary Education from North Central College. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Sandy to you. I know she'll be a great asset to both Highland Elementary School, uh, the district as a curriculum coordinator, in particular with our uh, bilingual program. So please come on up and introduce yourself. Thank you everyone, buenas noches. Um, it's really an honor to be uh, in front of all of you and I just am very grateful to be part of um, this district. I am a resident of Donners Grove and I just look forward to um, serving the Highland uh, staff and D58 uh, students and families in the community. Really nice to meet you. Thank welcome. you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. welcome. All right, next up is our recommendations for action. First up is a, uh, the 2022 through 2026 DG ESP contract. Is there a motion to approve the 2022 through 2026 contract with the Downers Grove, uh, Downers Grove Educational Support Personnel, IEA, NEA, as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2022 through 2026 contract with the Downers Grove Educational Support Personnel, IEA, NEA, as presented. Next up is a resolution appointing school treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution appointing school treasurer as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, to, ad to adopt a resolution uh, appointing uh, school treasurer as presented. 
We have a resolution approving a surety bond of the treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution approving a surety bond of treasurer as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution approving the surety bond of treasurer as presented. It's that time of year now where we got to set our Board of Education <laughs> meeting calendar for the next year. Is there a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting calendar for 2022 through 2023 as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? There's a, uh, this one, our first meeting will be in July. That's at Bel Air School to speak to that for a second. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, due to conflicts with the village schedule, um, we were not able to secure this room as much as we have in the past. And so you will see certain times of year where we have to be at uh, other locations. We have moved to O'Neill Middle School being our primary go-to. However, uh, due to the summer cleaning schedule and everything that's taking place at the middle school, we could certainly still have the meeting at O'Neill, but we would be competing with a lot of storage from classrooms and summer cleaning. Um, we also chose Bel Air. Uh, we haven't been to Bel Air in a while. Uh, Bel Air is a fully air conditioned uh, facility for, for a summer meeting, and it just has a little bit more flexibility in terms of the library space, and so that's the room that we'll be utilizing for that meeting. Uh, but I do want to call the board's attention to the availability of this room just won't be what it has been in, in previous years. Um, certainly the other conversation we're having with the village as we um, continue on our partnership with a long-term facility is really taking a look at what are some you know sacred days that the village could always have the room and then worth, what, what is the day that we could have and, and so we will certainly explore that possibility as we move forward. It could mean perhaps moving our meeting off of a Monday night to a Tuesday or Wednesday, but uh, again, we, we will continue to talk about that. Uh, in our initial conversations with the village regarding that, uh, we received very positive feedback and in, in willingness to look at that. I know it was a little bit more than what you asked, Karat, but it really provides some, uh, <laughs> some answers. Satisfactory. I'll take it. <laughs> Any other questions? Discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the Board of Education meeting calendar for the 2022 through 2023 as presented. Uh, next up uh, is the key performance indicators number one, uh, students' achievement, and number two, growth. Is there a motion to adopt key performance indicators number one, academic achievement, and key performance indicator number two, academic growth, as outlined in the attached memo? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you so much for, I know we took the scenic route, but we ended up in the same place. So thank you for flushing it out and, and it was good that we took the time to, to go through all it. So I appreciate all your lengthy conversations and slides. Thank you. You're gonna miss this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the key performance indicator, indicators number one, academic achievement, and key performance indicator number two, academic growth, as outlined in the attached memo. Uh, next up is stop loss insurance. Is there a motion to award the bid for the specific stop loss insurance coverage to Voya at a cost of $1,653,738.40? for the plan year of July 1st, 2022 through June, assuming 30th, uh, 2023. So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for specific stop loss insurance coverage to Voya at a total cost of $1,653,738.40 for the plan year of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Uh, workers' compensation property and casualty insurance. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the insurance coverages presented in the attached memo for the period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 at a total cost of $476,595. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. 
Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of the insurance coverages presented in the attached memo for a period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 at a total cost of $476,595. Next up is the renewal of a copier lease. Is there a motion to approve the maintenance and lease contract with Proven IT for $17,794.02 per month for five years? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the maintenance and lease contract with Proven IT for $17,794.02 per month for five years. Uh, next up is the food contract renewal. Is there a motion to approve the food service contract with Aramark with the reimbursable lunch price at $3.12? Uh, 0.56 cents and milk priced at uh, 0.4019 uh, for the 2022 through 2023 uh, school year. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, quick discussion on this. Mm -hmm. I want to note that the um, the reimbursement through the federal government now is back to normal mm -hmm. yeah, in the way that we're, we're In terms it. of how we deliver lunches in schools, uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture extended free lunch and breakfast to anybody who really wanted it. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, regardless of your qualifying income. That is no longer the case. We are back to what it was like in 2019, meaning that you, you or meaning, excuse me, that you have to meet income levels in order to qualify. That being said, District 58 will continue to work with any family in need, whether that's through our Blessings in a Backpack program supported by our PTA. Um, in our board policy, we also have extenuating circumstances for things like fee waivers that I can grant uh, during any kind of financial hardship uh, for a particular family. So if anyone is listening and we will continue to make this available to our families, please reach out to our school district if you're having financial trouble or if you have a need. We will always make sure that no child ever goes hungry, but in terms of the food coming from the USDA and who gets free food um, without any questions asked that we're back to those income thresholds. Kevin, can we make sure that um, towards the beginning of the school year, principals highlight that change for families because some people might not be aware that that's happening and then also the option that if there is a hardship or something that they can reach out to their principals to the district so people just every opportunity to make people aware yeah absolutely we'll, we'll tackle that in uh, two ways uh, we'll communicate it from a district level so I know Megan's here tonight so Megan will make uh, we'll make note of that but we'll also talk with our building principals mm -hmm. as well all right any other discussion on that all right Melissa will you please go roll member Ellis aye member Hannes aye member Harris aye member Olchick aye member Weiner aye Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the food service contract with Aramark with reimbursable lunch priced at three dollars and twelve uh, five six cents, uh, and milk priced at forty point one nine cents uh, for the twenty twenty two through twenty twenty three school year. Next, we have MacBook and iPad purchases for staff. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of thirty MacBook Airs and thirty iPads for a total cost of thirty two thousand one hundred ninety dollars? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Just one quick quick point of, uh, admit under the administrative considerations. It's kind of for this one and the next one, but um, you submitted to the um, program to get them reimbursed. When does that come in, the results of that? Any idea or? I mean, the, <laughs> short, the short answer is no. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, think, I think they know these funds are meant to be allocated for the next fiscal year and that school districts are hoping to order this stuff. Uh, so I mean, I check the newsletters every week and they're, they're doing it on somewhat of a rolling basis, but I haven't seen a ton of movement in those uh, announcements coming through. So, so we will have to make some strategic decisions you know, in the next month as to whether we're gonna, you know, what we're gonna order in advance of finding out whether or not we're awarded these funds. Any other discussion, comments? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 30 MacBook Airs and 30 iPads for a total cost of $32,190. Next up is middle school Chromebook purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 500 Lenovo 300E Chromebooks, which include Google device licenses, for a total cost of $177,320 uh, from CDWG? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. 
Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 500 Lenovo 300E Chromebooks with included Google devices licenses for a total cost of $177,320 from CDWG. Last up is the surplus equipment. Is there a motion to designate two American disinfectant sprayers, 3,500 sixth generation iPads, and 300 HP laser jet printers as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate two American disinfectant sprayers, uh, 300, uh, 3,500 sixth generation iPads and 300 HP laser jet printers as surplus equipment. I got one announcement tonight. The next meeting will be Monday, July 11th at 7 p.m. It will be over at Bel Air uh, Elementary School. Uh, now the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to, to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. Collective uh, negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. That's 5 ILCS 122C2. Uh, and last up is the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by Section 2.065 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet in the back room at 940.